All right. Flat chat episode 150. Good vibes today. Good vibes today. Good, good about the vibes. Wait, we are great. I love those an empty portrait. Yeah, yeah we, did, just, we just. <laughs> there's an empty portrait. The vibes yeah, are just going to be immaculate. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't, I don't have a three box. I don't have a three box in this layout that I have. It were supposed to have four people. There, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just put a but, clown picture. Can, do we have the technology to do that? Uh, okay. Sure, I can try to do this live. Uh, why not? Okay, so I have to put in on a, UR, a URL to like replace the camera. Okay. And so if I get the okay. URL to a picture, maybe I can put URL the picture. URL JPEG of a clown. Okay, Easy. Yeah. All right, I like let me this. see. A vast like overwatch. Yeah, why not? Let's let's take this picture. I wonder if I can. I don't even know if it's gonna work. So I think yeah. I mean, we'll see. We'll find out. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. There it is. Perfect. Let's go. <laughs> it's like he never left. Damn. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So Avas couldn't make it because obviously. He is doing some Borpa business. Um, and I believe he's flying tomorrow. I believe he's flying to Korea tomorrow for... Um, yeah. For stuff. So he couldn't join us because, you know, we're, we're second priority in that regard. Um, Matt couldn't join us because he's in the middle of nowhere. Um, Avril can't join us because he's in LA. Uh, and honestly, I, I just ran out of options and I said, fuck it, we'll do it, the three of us. And this is going to be great. So, here we go. Let's go. That's why the three of us are here. If it isn't abundantly clear, I think all three of us as well are just we are we are at the end of our ropes right now. We are we are going into the start of the off season, and you know it's been a hard week. We're just sort of getting through it right now. Yeah, I'm I'm actually gonna light it's a candle. Weird week. You guys say so. he's, oh, we got a he's gonna light a candle. Jack, you're so super dark, by the way. I know, dude. I. Big. In the dark, man. Not allowed. Let me live my life. All right, look at us. We're ready to go. The vibes we got a candle immaculate. on. We got lights on. The vibes are immaculate. Yeah. Let's fucking hit this shit. We got some fresh redwood and warm cinnamon candles going. This is the life. You need 95 uh, wood cut. Uh, 90 wood cut for that, mate. <laughs> All right. What's up, YouTube chat? How's it going? Um, all right, so this is the start, I suppose. If you're an audio listener and you just started this podcast on like Spotify, you're like, what, what are these guys doing? They're just vibing, chilling. Well, today is big vibes, all right? Got a big episode talking about... That's the title of the episode. The title of the episode is Dallas Fuel or your 2022 World League Champions. Hell yeah. And Thanks. it's factually correct. Dallas Fuel won. They did it! Woo! God, yeah! <laughs> there were so many things about this playoffs that I just like. Is this a dream? Like this, this just yeah, uh, complete imposter syndrome the entire week. At Dallas Fuel to win it all, S cycle of misery. The Dallas Fuel starting with the 2018 stuff to lead to this point. It just, it just couldn't be more perfect. It's, it's incredible we got it to this point. The best yeah. winner we could ask for, like yeah, the one. Well, maybe not in everybody's books, you know, a lot of Houston Outlaws fans out there, but we'll get that. Story-wise, yeah, I think, I think you might be right, story-wise. Yeah. yeah, I think, I think it, I was worried, okay, Shock fans don't come at me, but yeah. <laughs> I'm actually glad that Shock didn't win. Uh, they, they're like, their franchise already has two, two chips, like as much as it would have been a cool storyline that they've won three proper one, wins, literally every single award under the sun. That's crazy. Like, I think it is better. Like, it's just cool to me that the Dallas Fuel won and that they, like, they've invested a lot into this league. They have been one of the most prominent franchises throughout the history of the Overwatch League. Like, even in 2018 and all that kind of stuff, they've always made content. They've always put their best foot forward. They've always tried to have a good roster. The fact that they finally got a win, uh, I think is big. I also, a part of me, this kind of felt like Dallas Fuel's last dance. If they come back next year and they're also just as like strong and just as talented, I will be I'll be surprised. A part of me felt like this was like at least this specific Dallas Fuel's roster, like last try at like a championship. 
I don't know if that's just like sports in me coming out. Well, yeah, what, what, uh, uh, what makes you say that? I, I don't know. I think it's the idea and the feel that there is this younger generation coming through the league in a lot of ways, if that makes sense of like, you know, you have a lot of like the shock uh, players, the rookies coming in. We have a bunch of really good players coming in all over the league. And Dallas Fuel sort of does have a very old guard style of roster right now. You know, they're coming from the you know, element mystic days. For all we know, you know, we've heard rumors of players potentially retiring. It could be any of those players. Like, it feels like. For me, the length of the career is always sort of like a timing factor of like how good are they really going to be. There are very few players that have like broken that mold. And that's like, you know, when you think of your profits and you're that kind of stuff, like even Bird Ring, you know, was a player who we respected was at the top of his game. But at the end of the day, he just went on to retire because he wanted to do something else. Yeah. Yeah, that, that way I can see it. Absolutely. I mean, Fearless has been grinding for like five years now. Um, yeah, you know, contenders. I think he would be the one to retire if, uh, out of any of them, to be honest. Yeah. If uh, if he felt like it, obviously he didn't play like a crazy amount this year, but played a lot, obviously during the grand finals and stuff. So, I think for going back to like the main point, I suppose that is the perfect winner because Fearless went zero forty on the Shanghai Dragons in the first year, yeah. and now he won. I think that's perfect poetry. Yeah, um, and. Yeah, I, but I do think if anybody was to retire, it probably would be fearless. But we don't really know what the future holds because obviously it being kind of a new game and Dallas Fuel winning, you can imagine they're going to try and keep the roster as intact as possible. I don't know. I, I didn't really feel the same skepticism as you, Scott, going into to next year. There is a lot of like rookie talent coming up, but I mean, maybe the old guard still stands strong. It's, it's hard to tell. It really is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, what what is what is the quote-unquote old guard on Dallas. It's Sparkle, Dallas, Fielder, and Hanbin. I think I would put Edison in that list. Like, these are and guys Edison. that have been in the league for, like, four years now. And as I said, like, yeah, I don't really and, have anything to justify my point. Uh, yes, and here, here's the point I'll make. Sparkle, Fielder, Edison, Hanbin. Oh. They're all 20 years old, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> They're 20 yeah. years old. <laughs> Doha I don't is think 22. they're going anywhere Doha just yet. 22. Doha's I, pushing it at 22 years old. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, I'll see you guys next year. For uh, when we're on the next year, I'm I'm gonna see where Dallas is. I don't Gio know. Is I, they might have one of the youngest rosters in the league, bro. <laughs> that's it. They're going on a dynasty. They're they're going on a dynasty. They're about to win it three times in a row. I'm I'm changing my tone. I'm beating He's to a new drum. it. Yeah. I um. I get what you're saying though. Like when yeah. Like when people say that like Overwatch players like get old, it's not so much like the actual age as just like the next generation coming up and sort of like dethroning them, like taking what they learned and like what made them professionals and then reiterating on top of that and like um, being e even better. So, you know, when we, when we say that like players get old, I don't think you can really like look at the, the, the physical age as much as just like how long they've been around and like how hard it is to always like redefine your play and like who you are and like keep up with the young players because you know the like the the, the facts i, I want to say facts but it's not really facts but like it's easier to like it's easier to learn um like everything there is to know about something like leading up to the top rather than like discovering or like innovating right do you get what i mean so like it's easier for the, the younger, like 16, 17, 18, year olds to like catch up to where pro play is right now. But then when you have to like, all right, well, what does it look like if you're 5% if you're more accuracy than Shy? What, what does it look like if you're 5% better than Lip? Like, that is incredibly difficult. And so like, when, when you've been around Overwatch for quite some time, it's incredibly hard to like redefine yourself and like up your game and like constantly improving in that regard. In many ways, like some people plateau. So I don't know who that's going to be now. It doesn't seem like Dallas Fuel is that, but it's an interesting point when you discuss like how pe I, long people have been around and like how motivated they are to grind. I, I, I want to use like a specific example because I feel like a lot of people are going to take my point not the right way. I have a very simple example, which is the Shanghai Dragons of, you know, the last three years. Like that is kind of the cycle that I'm talking about. In 2020 was the beginning of this like super team roster. They ended up falling short in the finals. 
uh they had a great team but then all of a sudden in 2021 they had that run they were unbeatable they were incredible they won the playoffs and then you go on to the next year and it's hard to combat this uh i think especially in esports that after you win the championship a lot of players just by default get complacent because at the end of the day you've kind of accomplished everything that you've ever wanted to accomplish there are very few teams that have been able to coach or continue that motivation to have the same level of success so that's sort of what I'm talking about in that regard of like, it can be hard. It's easy when you have that one thing to fight for, but for a lot of players, after you've accomplished that, you don't really have left to go, uh, much left to go for. So that's sort of my question of, will that happen to the Dallas Fuel or will they continue to be this super team? They have a great coach like Rush. Maybe he can motivate and keep this team going in the same way that Krusty did from 2019 to 2020, but that's yet to be seen. Yeah, I, I, I do think that Shanghai Dragons is probably the most like applicable like example to what you're saying like yeah the, these players have been around for longer um you know isayaki is 22 fate is 24 void is 26 Leta is, is 23 um and you know i don't know what the exact like law is in korea with the military service maybe you know jaws because you you know you like korea but if someone knows the actual like laws, okay, no, like you know, let us know in the YouTube chat because I do think you know there is that time pressure, right? You have to do it in like your twenties or something, and so yeah, yeah, there's a date where you have to do it by like to give <laughs> to give a funny example. Um, you know the biggest band or like group in the world right now, BTS. Yeah. Like they currently. Uh, splitting up or like taking a break because they have to go into military service like there was a point in time um i remember wolf kind of talking to me about this a long time ago where you can just almost infinitely defer the military service if you kind of prove especially if you're overseas that you're competing or doing whatever and i guess competing for the country in a way via esports um so you can just kind of keep deferring it um but even it will eventually catch up to you is what i'm saying like yeah. even bts have to like break up go to the military service and then come out and then i don't know what to do after that but um i think a lot of it. the younger players at least because dude some of the um some of the players like they're only dude they're only like 20 to 23 kind of thing they can continue to defer if they really want to i think a lot of people kind of want to get out of the way but you'd want to make the most of your playing career before you end up having to uh, go to the military. And if you just continue to play in the Overwatch League, you're going to be able to defer at least for, you know, a few more years, even if you're like 23, 24 kind of thing. It is kind of what I uh, gather. It, that's yet to be seen. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, one second. We're in the wrong vibes for talking about how great Dallas Fuel is. We're talking about retirements. We're hey, talking about hey, things. hey, we're going to get there. Okay, all right. Sorry. I know that the Dallas Fuel fans, they're already like fucking itching. All right. They're like <laughs> scratching. They're fucking biting their nails. Just like, holy shit. Are they going to talk about the actual like performance and gameplay? Oh my God. The finals. Like, oh my God, my players. No, we're not going to go talk about proper. All right. We'll fucking talk about the Dallas Fuel. All right. The, I know it was a joke to some people on the Reddit. All right. I know people were having fun with it. They're laughing. But there were some serious people who genuinely the first thing when Dallas Fuel won, like I genuinely saw it in like the post-match thread of like San Francisco Shock versus Dallas Fuel in the finals. And like one of the other comments was like, I can't wait for Plat Chat to not talk about Dallas Fuel. Like if your <laughs> if your what favorite the franchise fuck are you saying? if your favorite franchise literally an hour ago just won the championship and your first comment is Plat Chat is not going to talk about us, you're in the wrong mindset. You have the wrong conversations. <laughs> Come on, guys. I know it's a joke to some people, but of course we're going to talk about the actual um, Dallas Fueler. I, I didn't consider this topic like Dallas Fuel per se. I think we're just kind of like vibing. Oh, also like a pre-show uh, kind of thing. You okay, know, yeah, okay, okay, Post-playoff sure. stuff. So we'll, we'll get to the actual, actual win here. The fucking Dallas Fuel fans. They're, they're, they're like little animals. They're just running around <laughs> celebrating. and you know, They're all over the place. They're like on the walls. You know, they're having the time of their life. Good, good times, good times. Um... All right. Well, there's no better way. Um, yes, indeed. Chat, um, chat did work correct. They aligned what what my Google search is. It felt like me and everyone in chat Google at the same time. They have to enlist before 28. Um, there you go. So yeah. So that seems you to can be right. defer it quite a while. Yeah, and um, I think I already saw that screenshot as well of Void signing off of Overwatch, where he was like, "Goodbye, 
I'm quitting Overwatch now. And then he logged off. Yeah, and, goodbye. Um, yeah, it was like very sad. And I was like, damn. He just, he just logged off, bro. Dude, Johnny was right. Void is washed. And we've, we've, we've finally, we've come full circle two, year, two years later, three years later. <laughs> Man, you're making me feel bad over here. <laughs> Void is washed. I, I, I am taking no happiness or pride in that Void is retiring. What an absolute legend of the scene. When we did those top 10 rankings, like earlier this year, um, I think Void, we decided was, Void was like a top three player of all time mm -hmm. in Overwatch 1. And now top three player of the past, retiring, joining the military. Hella sad, bros. Void, awesome player. I, um, I think the Shanghai Dragons will be the last time we see them in this iteration, at least. It sounds like there's a, a bunch of rumors of players either retiring or, you know, there's been rumblings of certain players going to Valorant and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to Shanghai Dragons because there needs to be overhauls, right? Like coming into this year, I think you could justify not making changes to that roster. But uh, going into this next year, after their performance as a whole uh, this year, I think you'll see a very different Shanghai Dragons. Uh, yeah. So I'm just going to change the topic to Shanghai than Dallas because fans are going to mold otherwise. I, I do think it's an interesting topic. And I don't think because Shanghai Dragons went out the first round, I don't think we're going to hit Shanghai Dragons like later in the show anyway. So I might yeah. as well just do it now. I actually think, I so completely agree that, you know, three, four members of their team might leave. Um, you know, th th there's rumor that that could totally happen. And this roster could kind of like get severed in half. What I will say though, there's some real interesting prospects potentially hitting the market if they want to like refurbish their roster and they could even be better next year. And that would be crazy to me. So, you know, while a part of us is sad already that, um, that Shanghai Dragons, you know, some of their players might retire. Imagine this team, but like Fate and Void maybe retire or whatever and they pick up like someone from the Fruit of AM tier on this roster. Maybe they pick up another damage player to play alongside Lip and then leave Zagoni Sayaki stay and they suddenly... The like your roster is almost like better because say what you will about fate and void they're legends but there's exciting talent like someone like someone i think is the hottest tank prospect right now boring rookies you know they're there there's great contenders talent and avril i had korean barbecue with him yesterday and he just like shielded me on this tank guy and contenders just like this guy's going to be absolutely <laughs> sick and i'm like all right all right all right but <laughs> someone is someone who's proven himself this year probably maybe as a contract for me and we'll see when that tracker comes out if there's a player tracker this year but like there are legitimate pieces on like mid-level teams that could totally take the the step up to like top teams and then maybe shanghai is one of those teams that like oh my god wait they are better in 2023 that this is crazy so um well we'll see what happens but i'm not you know if some of these top teams like they change up their roster a little bit i'm not going to rule out that they could be even better next year so we'll see what happens um yeah uh we'll discuss shanghai a little bit more when we bring up the bracket later we're gonna bring up the picking bracket i've i've taken a glance it's not pretty guys it's not pretty yeah but uh, pick and bracket? Yes, oh, it's, it's not it's not great yeah um, oh, didn't you guys we put the smurf heads all the way through to the end didn't oh we? you shut up we put gladiators yeah. up there as well because of you so yeah well we all make mistakes <laughs> to be fair everybody thought the glads was going to be good like I don't know. Uh, I'm, many I'm ready to rant about that. the gladiators, but that's yeah. a later problem. Well, we'll, we'll okay. set it later. We have a dedicated topic to gladiators. You know, we're going to talk a lot about the teams individually, um, but let let's then kick it off. All right, here we go. I consider this the start of the podcast almost. Dallas Fuel are the 2022 Overwatch League champions. They did it. They did it, oh. and what a way to do it as well. You know, they came in as Never the number doubted. one seed. They were the summer showdown Western Region champions. They come in and they just absolutely just destroy the opposition. Like it, it, it was not up until the finals. It was not even close. Um, they obviously um, found, found out like their way to play the meta. Uh, they have the perfect personnel for it. Fearless stepped in and was just like an absolute beast, despite being benched for most of the time. Um, so yeah, there you have it. Dallas Fuel on to San Francisco Shock and proper winning MVP and Grand. Uh, no, he didn't win Grand Finals MVP. Um, Proper, no, I'm just kidding. We're not gonna jump, talk about, we're not gonna jump ahead. Uh, <laughs> Dallas Fuel winning. I mean, what a story. We, we, we thought it already, but like, what a story for this franchise to, to win the finals. What are your like, big picture thoughts about their run in the playoffs? My, the thing that I found the most impressive about their run is that like, I think you look at this entire, entire like five player Dallas roster that made it through this playoffs, like 
every single one of them was playing their role at such a high level. Like there are other teams that you can point at and you can be like, the Hongzhou Spark, Shy and Gushui are really the linchpin of this team. Like they are the ones massively overperforming. Same thing with the Shanghai Dragons of the Lip. Like he was just by far playing the best on that team. I think everyone on the, on the Dallas Fuel was playing at a ridiculously high level at what they needed to do. And that's one of the reasons that they were able to overcome the shock in the grand finals, a team that was also having like a crazy run through the lower bracket. So massive props needs to go to Dallas Fuel. They definitely didn't play as well in the grand finals, in my opinion, as they did throughout the rest, but that's just playing the grand finals. I have no complaints. That finals was fucking lit. Like that was the best grand finals we've ever had in the Overwatch League. Yeah. Uh, you can't complain about Easily. that gameplay. And Dallas feel absolutely deserving of a championship, especially this year. Yeah, that was... De- I want to echo that. Best grand finals we've ever had. Going the full distance and then it being... I guess what would have been slightly more hype would have been match like a map eight, you know, if a, a draw happened. But okay, anyone let's calm was, down, Jay. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm just saying, like, go more... A reverse stick. sweep, bro. But, like, <laughs> on, even on push, on the last um, map, like, even that was, like, super fucking close. Like, god damn. I don't think we could have asked for a better fucking finals. And like you said, everybody was playing out of their mind. And obviously, he won grand finals MVP. But, like, Fearless coming in after almost a year of Hanbin was also just ridiculous. Like, god damn. It's, it's like, wow. Obviously, this guy is still very good at Winston. Like, very, very good. And, yeah, I don't know. That was just a, a cherry on top, I think. Because everybody was like well, they're going to just rotate when the meta changes and shit. And then it's like, ah, well, actually, there's a lot of off tanks being played. Yeah. So Hanbin makes the most sense. Then even Hanbin filling in. He played Ryan this year. He played Winston as well. Like, you know, they, they subbed in fillers every now and then to kind of pick up those uh, heroes when they went to like Watchpoint Gibraltar, for example, or something like that. But yeah, fillers coming in, having a, a small redemption arc, I suppose, after not playing for almost a year. Like, dude, what an absolute beast. It all... It, it also, sorry, it also can't be understated how much trust Rush has in Fearless in that decision as well. Oh, yeah. There is a yeah. world in which they could have just been like, Hanbin has a ton of synergy. He's been playing incredible for this team. Let's just have him play Winston. He'll work it out. And like, that seems ridiculous, but there were multiple teams who tried that, like in these playoffs to make success, right? Like Atlanta Rain tried to play Hawk off the rip. Right to just sort of be like, hey, we don't want to try and integrate Gator because Hawk, we, you know, they've already, Brad's already talked about it. Hawk has the most experience with this roster. He is the integral tank. We don't want to, even if Gators are better Winston, we don't want to do that. They only did that in their second series when their back was against the wall. Another one was the Houston Outlaws that had a ton of success, right? With Dante switching over to that Winston. I don't want to go too deep into that, but the trust that Fearless would be able to come in, fit seamlessly in this team and perform at the level that he did to win MVP finals, massive credit to Rush and Fearless. Yeah, I am... Um... I don't know if this is public information, so I can't say my source, but I, I did hear that Dallas Fuel, they ran internal scrims some point in the season with Aid and Rascal. Um, and that was a way to keep both Fearless and Hanbin um, like, sort of like active in scrims and like, you know, playing, staying fresh. Whereas some other teams, they didn't have access to like the ranked game modes, for example, before Overwatch 2 was released. So maybe Fearless got in some scrim practice. Um, and, you know, those are pretty two pretty stacked teams, you know, <laughs> like Aiden Rascal, you know, their former our players, they, they're they probably still hot, right? So that could have helped in Fearless um, being good in that regard. Um, I also think it can't be understated, and I think you made this comparison, Scott, that, like, this meta was pretty similar to the zombie comp we saw last year mm-hmm. in 2021. And obviously, like, Dallas Fuel, they just stepped into that and, like, played really good. Um, amazingly, in fact. Um... And the point I wanted to make with that was shit. Now I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, I said it's on broadcast as well. That um, the the uh, the, the counter to um to the zombie comp that Dallas Fuel ran last year, it was the wrecking ball from the Shanghai Dragons. So the key to beating Dallas Fuel on the zombie comp was playing the wrecking ball and almost like countering their tempo, um, by a different style of play, right? But wrecking ball not viable this time around in this tournament. And so in many ways, like. Dallas Fuel were unbeaten on the Winston comps because Shanghai was like, we got to play Wrecking Ball into this because we can't match them on the Winston. And with no Wrecking Ball available this tournament, Dallas Fuel, again, they're just like, they're the best Winston Lucio team. And you saw, like, 
on social media throughout the entire tournament that like <laughs> staff members, coaches and everything, players from other teams, they were just like, yeah, when Dallas Fuel plays Lucio Winston, like they're just like the best in the world. It you can't better, really yeah. do anything. Oh, you, yeah. you, you just hope you can book a scrim and then like review the scrim and be like, oh, this is what the best possible Winston Lucio comp looks like. So like all the other teams, they're like, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're, they're insane at this shit. Um, yeah. So they kind of dominated. It is, a, it is an interesting thing to talk about because we, we talked to like multiple people who sort of said like, and we heard these rumors of coming into the playoffs, it was going to be Winston Tracer. And I think there's a lot of, because with how limited amount of runtime there was in terms of practicing this meta, um, I think it was only like five days of scrims, that sort of resulted in why everyone was playing the same thing because there wasn't time to experiment and try other things uh there were rumors that like certain teams were trying like roadhog or trying different things and that potentially if you were playing something else that resulted in you struggling because eventually what happened is instead of the winston tracer dallas came up with the reaper and that sort of changed the game and the dynamic because it made it that zombie comp that was almost impossible to dive and like everyone stays together as a hive mind and that's such a big strength of the Dallas Fuel. So Dallas has been a team, and I'm kind of glad that they won and then they got to dictate the meta of the playoffs because throughout the year, everyone always says Dallas is the team that determines what the meta is. So I feel like it's cool that they got the advantage in the final hour by dictating the meta in the way that they do because so many teams have just sort of taken what Dallas has done and done it a little bit better or iterated on it. So Dallas finally getting to like close out with the strengths that they had. Uh, so I think it's kind of cool that, you know, and I think Dallas definitely deserved this championship for those kind of reasons. Yeah. So the, the, there were some discussions and we'll get to the other teams later that like obviously the, 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 the early patch close to playoffs, like it definitely impacted some teams' ability to prepare accordingly. And like the meta was very much in flux, like leading into the playoffs. Like uh, the, the way I understood it, like this Reaper thing, like it got, it got like added into the mix, like pretty, pretty close to playoffs itself. Like majority of teams were playing this Tracer iteration, right? And then the Reaper came in like just before the playoffs. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, I'm kind of happy still that like the two teams in the finals were number one and number two seed, uh, which, you know, some yeah. speaks to the level of play from both Dallas Fuel and the San Francisco Shock making their ridiculous lower bracket run. Um, before we move on, though, you know, Dallas Fuel, Fearless, Grand Finals MVP, we already hit on it. It's, it's the most, in, you know, I tweeted about this. It's the most insane individual story we have in the award space uh, from the Owen 40 Shanghai Dragons, like you said, Jaws, to now winning Grand Finals MVP. It's, it's, I mean, it's unbelievable. So I get that, you know, when you watch the match, you're like, okay, Edison is playing the soldier and Edison is finding all these picks, but like, it, it was almost like meant to be. And Fearless was like incredible throughout the tournament as well, because like the impact of Winston was obvious, you know, primal raging, isolating sojourns, creating space for your sort of team. In many of these matchups, like you could tell Fearless was just like the better Winston, the way he got positioning for his team the, the bubble usage stuff like that so i understand that like most people they probably think that edison had the best performance in the finals overall but I, I don't think it's like unfair for fearless to get the award either he was incredible so what an incredible end to his story as well just yeah. magical um doesn't have to be the end of the story no, but I've thought about this as well like where do you go from here like i feel like if i'm fearless i'm just vibing you know i'm you just vibing. back to back Back Easy. to back. He's yeah, getting but the MVP next year, back, baby. You and know. then they go 40 and 0. <laughs> the true redemption. Yeah, he's not allowed to retire until he goes 40 and 0. Yeah. What's their win streak at now? Didn't they have like, oh, wait, there's. No, they broken, lost right? to Houston at their own uh, homestand. Oh, right. Homestead, yeah. Because they were, they, were, um, they were getting close to those records, right? That would have well, also yeah, been that, quite that's the only That's the only match that the Dallas Fuel has lost since. The midseason madness when they lost to the Philadelphia Fusion. Yeah, that is the so only ridiculous. match that the Dallas Fuel has lost since midseason madness. So if they had won that, they would be on a ridiculous media. Because I don't think yeah. they lost a match at. Did they lose a match at the Summer Showdown, actually? No. No. They didn't they get knocked down a lot, the right, did they? They took down yeah. Shock. I think they beat Shock 4 0 3 0 or 3 0 4. Yeah, that is true. 3 0 4. They, they did, yeah. The so last they haven't time lost they lost a match. match was in July. No, they lost to the Houston Owls. In, oh no! Uh, apart from that, apart oh yeah, from that, w was in July. Yeah, mid-season madness. 
which is ridiculous. Yeah. Also, if the Outlaws did make the finals too, and then they beat the Outlaws, that had also been very poetic because the two times that they play, or the, the amount of times they played Outlaws on land and just lost is yeah. also a little bit ridiculous. So, yeah, that also that would also have been a very, very... I doubt cool you'll play Houston Outlaws in the winner's final, and that match wasn't that close. So No, that that is very true. That is very true. I guess the, the back-to-back would have been quite cool, but yeah, yeah. I, the grand finals definitely wouldn't have been as Pog. Yeah. Did you see the uh, the messages from Fearless in his own Discord? It was on I was on Reddit yesterday. No, I, I, was, no, I don't think so. I it, it, it was hilarious, you know, as a former player as well. But he it was essentially like he didn't really have any proper food like the day off, and he was so nervous that like he downed two energy drinks before going on stage. And oh, then, that's like, a terrible classic, idea. Classic. He ended up throwing up before they walked out, like in the bathroom really? or something. And then he was like, "Oh my god, I'm so nervous!" And then he downed two more energy drinks on stage, and he's just like oh. a fucking wreck. And he's just, he's just like, uh, I, I think Don't that was, do that. I think that was what he, uh, what, what the message was. Uh, I'm just riffing here, but that was essentially the message that he like just threw up and then like down two more energy drinks and like I'm fine, you know. And then you know all over the Jesus place. Jesus Christ! Um, just obviously they were so they were so nervous going into that grand finals. This so. is a PSA to all younger players, okay? And Johnny can speak to this because I, I know I've heard a story from Johnny as well. When you are going onto stage. The best thing you can do is keep everything as consistent as you always do it usually. Like trying to like peak by taking three Red Bulls as much as, oh, Fearless won the grand finals doing that. Most of the time, like you get on there and you're like, I can't even focus. Like I'm, a, I'm just a fucking mental wreck. Just jittery. Yeah. yeah. So just be careful when you're doing that stuff. If you want to ch- chug two Red Bulls, get used to chugging two Red Bulls before you go on stage. Yeah. It needs to be within your tolerance. I saw um, Roston tweeted. <laughs> It was, it was funny. Uh, it didn't it would go public either. Oh, yeah, it didn't go viral either. Uh, Roston posted a picture. It was like, the Philadelphia Fusion's like annual tradition or something of having donuts on match day or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, no, don't get a sugar spike before the match. <laughs> like, this is a terrible idea. And, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe the, the players just had like, you know, one bite and then like left it on or whatever. But it was just funny because, you know, back in Apex days as well, whenever we go to Apex, like... We, 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 we never like brought food to the arena or anything like that. And so we're sitting around waiting and we'd always have pizza before, before our matches. So we, you know, 30 minutes before the match started at Apex, we just like eat pizza and then we'd have like fucking, we'd be, Jesus you know, Christ. we'd be too full and we're like going to the match and be like, oh, we had too much pizza. Oh. And then I, cause it was match day. We always had the thing, especially in Misfits as well. Cause we were on G Fuel at the time. Oh, a match day, you know, time to double up on G Fuel. And I remember, <laughs> I remember. What the fuck? Yeah, it was terrible. It was terrible. And I remember specifically against um, Lunatic High in Apex Season 2. I just like, I was fucking caffeine overloaded. I don't know what the, the word is. I was so overstimulated. So like we came in with a game plan and I'm sitting on fucking King's Row against Lunatic High and I'm just like bouncing off the walls and I'm like, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't remember what it was supposed to do. So like the point being is, don't fucking, you know, just like chug energy drinks and like go out of your norm, like before match days. If anything, keep it standard and maybe even go down a little notch because like you need to be clear headed. You need to be like in the zone. You can't be overstimulated, like all that shit. That's the worst possible idea ever. So just like I said, please, kids, don't fucking double up on caffeine on match days. And like caffeine doesn't make you better. Just do your normal thing to feel good in your everyday life and then just go with that vibe. Caffeine's not going to make you better. It's not going to give you better reflexes. It's not going to make you think better. So just keep it fucking normal, all right? Eat a, eat a tuna salad, a Caesar salad with some chicken or something what? and have some coffee and that's it, you know? You don't, don't need Don't try to get some food poisoning before he gets on stage by eating a tuna salad. <laughs> all right, to, be, to be fair, I also have that same like superstition in like, I don't eat anything too egregious so like when i was when i did losers finals i was like okay i don't want to eat anything too egregious that might that might upset my stomach like the day before i was like nope i'm not having anything crazy i'm just gonna have like normal bullshit and not try and eat anything that could potentially be undercooked so i feel like shit the next day and i have to cast feeling like crap so yeah i'm yeah, that's. I'm also kind of. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree. Yeah. Same boat. Yeah, and he. But Fearless ended up winning Grand Finals MVP. So maybe Which he is just. Fine. Maybe Which he is just great. to quote Custom. Maybe he just world starred on the, on the top of us and just like, hey, double energy drinks, throwing up. Just it's all good, man. You. Just, just MVP. Yeah. Hey, you do you, man. You, you do, the vibes you. out. Yeah. 
Um, it was also really funny, like, as a, you could tell, like, when they started at like, finals as well, and you just watched, like, the first 15 seconds on Li Jiang, that they were, like, nervous wrecks, like, no one wanted to engage. <laughs> we're just gonna let the Sojourns farm up, like, the Sojourns were, like, missing shots and just, like, you know, we're, we're, we're warming up, we're warming up to the finals, like, everyone's super nervous. It, you know, it's completely understandable, but I think it's, you know, funny when you see that kind of, like, emotion and, like, really the environment, like take charge of the players in that way we're just like the, this is not like playing online anymore like this is fucking the finals in an arena and fans are going crazy so uh, it, it was funny but there you go fearless uh wrapping us wrapping up his story and we'll see if he wins more stuff um anything else about the dallas fuel here um i gotta make sure we we've checked all the boxes before fuel fans mauled um they, they were dominant there you go playing the reaper comp across that whole team yeah. they deserved it Props they pounded yeah Absolutely. Now, San Francisco Shock. Proper. What a god this player is. Yeah, like, now we're now we set up by Dallas Fuel fans. <laughs> um, no, no, but sim for proper like everyone says we're going to. Yeah, I mean... I mean... I, 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 again, I kind of agree that it was nice for Fearless to win Grand Finals MVP and all this stuff. And I do think that, like, story-wise, purely story-wise, no bias or fan or, like, anything, Dallas Fuel winning was probably the right thing. But on the other side of the coin, we had an incredible finals on our hands, partly because what if the San Francisco Shock had completed the entire lower bracket run with proper winning MVP and potentially winning Grand Finals MVP as well? Like, there was no, there was no wrong direction of, like, the finals. There was no wrong result, because either way, we had Dallas Fuel winning it with Fearless or Proper going on this miracle lower bracket run. So regardless of what you think about Proper and us over-talking him, like, that run from Shock in its totality was incredible um entire way through and, and proper was lights out so like you know whether you're a fuel fan or not you gotta appreciate the shock slow back run i okay here's my thing and you know you can call us proper sims all the way through if you really want to do that but my man almost went rookie of the year roll star mvp and then pulled the San Francisco shock through the entirety of the lower bracket. He is the largest proponent of that team. You cannot even doubt that. He almost pulled that entire team through the lower bracket with some of the most ridiculous performance. Like that performance against the Houston Outlaws, shit just ain't fair. Yeah. Like I, everyone watching that game was like, that's just not fair. Like he, there are very few players who have done that throughout the history of the Overwatch League, like Shy in the midseason madness did a little bit. Lip did that for the Shanghai Dragons a little bit against the shock. But he was just lights out on that Sojourn. He is the MVP, clearly, in my eyes. You got to give mad props. He kept that series close against the Dallas Fuel. It's going to be a treat to watch him in the future. I think he deserved all the awards that he got. Um, yeah, San Francisco Shock. Whatever you're paying him, triple it. <laughs> I think it makes for a cool storyline going into next year. Like, will he continue on this, like, unbelievably dominant streak of performances? Or... Will it kind of teeter off a little bit? Obviously, this being his rookie year, and now he needs to kind of stamp home a title, like a big title. Um, and it was always it was always quite funny going through the season, watching the shock not doing well in tournaments whatsoever, but then completely dominant in a online environment in regular season. And it almost felt like this was how the shock was going to go out. Uh, they still weren't going to get the trophy because of their offline performances on lands not being that hot. Um, obviously, they were in the playoffs. They did really well, but it almost felt like this was almost bound to happen. I, I'm, I think it makes me more excited for proper next year because he's definitely going to be fueled because it kind of goes back to the, oh, what do you do now? Where do you go up from here? Well, proper's kind of won all the awards, but like he's not actually lifted that trophy. So you can imagine the determination and motivation for him is even higher now because of how like dominant his carry performance was. It's like, I didn't win. Like, what the hell, man? And now he's going to be like, I need to win. I just got to do it. Trophy's got to be mine. He's also dumb young as well. So like all those oh, other yeah. things that we, we talked about don't really apply to him. Like when you do that in your rookie year, you know, you, you can't just be satisfied. And like, that. like there was a, also like we're talking about if they had won the finals, right? 4-3, Proper would have won the finals MVP 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And he would have won the trophy. At that point, yeah, maybe you retire and just go to a different game because like he's literally won Overwatch League in every, in every sense of the word. So 
Um, you know, I, I do want to give props to the rest of the San Francisco Shock team as well. But before for their before run. you do that, before you do that, sorry. I, I, right. I, I want to bring up this. This is uh, the best final blow rates all time in the Overwatch League, the last five years. It probably includes 2018. Proper's Kings Row against Houston Outlaws with 19.9 final blows per 10 minutes. That's insane. It's the fifth best map when it comes to final blows per 10 minutes since like inception. You can see here 2019 Corey Washington against what, Vancouver on Hollywood 19.94 by the way shy with two of these in the playoffs yeah, that, against the same ridiculous. team <laughs> both that, through on defiant this that, was that the mid-season madness or no, was that these players no this was this playoffs Heinz oh through on defiant God, yeah. he got 21.4 and 21.7 final blows per 10 minutes and they're the shy two was best crazy. Crazy. Dude, two best shy maps. was actually a nut nut job like it, it, like this <laughs> this place as well like as i said there's not there's not many people who put on those levels of performances by uh, that proper did but shy is one of them like he's the same dude of just like he just owns a corner and kills a dude almost every single fight and it's like well what do you do yeah so, so this is 15 crazy. minutes you know you could put it on 10 minutes and you know come you know i, I think some control maps are like one-sided assault maps like get out of here but 15 minutes Two shy performances and then proper in the lower bracket final. This was 27 minutes. Is that what I'm looking at as well? I, it's, sorry, yeah, it's very 27. Yeah, 27. Th that, that's, that's, over, that's over 27 minutes. He did 15 final blows, right? Like if, if you up, up it to 25 minutes, Johnny, can you up it to 25 minutes? I'll, who's put, the closest? I'll put 20. I'll put 20. Okay, 20. Who, who is the closest to him in 20 in the, in the 20 minute category? Saya player. 2019 against the Valiant. Yeah, Sire. I remember that series. That series <laughs> fucking sucked. Dude was on <laughs> Widowmaker. On, that shit was on Junkertown, right? Does it say what it map? Yeah, it was on Junkertown. That map fucking sucked. He just wouldn't miss. So, yeah, that's kind of crazy. That, that's the other map. Uh, that's closest to it. <laughs> Punk versus Paris on Junkertown. <laughs> yeah. <Just> oh. <laughs> oh, my God. But, yeah, I mean, it was a rid ridiculous performance. I think we said after two maps... After the first two maps in that Houston series, Proper was at 17.5 final blows per 10 in the series. Yeah. And then it dropped down to 15 so in the series. But yeah, so when, when we talk about like individual performances, like Shy and Proper, that was some of the craziest shit. And yes, the meta plays into it. You could argue whether it's actual Overwatch to just like rely on your Sojourn. But those two players were like, that, that was different. Like that was absolutely historic performances by both shy and proper so there you go yeah anyway you wanted to give props to the rest of the shock i just had to highlight that first oh uh, yeah I, I, I do want to give props to the rest of the shock as much as i think proper was the big player in their lower bracket run you need to give credit to a lot of the other guys like i think uh finn and violet did, were really solid as a backline violet was charging sound barriers at a ridiculous rate like that was his big thing he was just trying to stay alive as long as possible and then just like pumping out sound barriers finn was doing a great job on the uh on the kiriko he definitely wasn't the best kiriko that we had in the playoffs but he was really solid um and then striker like you nobody was looking at striker and you the fact that Krusty decided in the final hour to sign Striker, recognizing that this meta might be very good for him, was genius. Like the fact that they could have Striker come in to play the Reaper in the playoffs is like he's done that before uh, for the San Francisco Shocks. And he has playoff experience, he knows how to play in big games. So he was a big part of that team as well. Uh, I think Mikey and Kalouge went back and forth in the playoffs as well. I, don't, I think neither one of them were perfect on the Winston and they were definitely not in your like top three in the playoffs, but I think they did their jobs and I don't have a problem with them playing Mikey all the way through the grand finals as well. I think it made sense. He was playing well. Uh, I think fearless was definitely got the better end of that stick. He won finals MVP for that reason. But uh, I think, I think the shock should be proud with what they accomplished. Obviously another second to their name, but you know, they, they, they were pretty they were pretty incredible throughout the entirety of the playoffs uh considering we thought they might go out first round to the shanghai dragons yeah oh yeah for sure uh completely agree um pretty much everything you said i think the only thing i i i i i heard that like people was it finn who said that he didn't get enough value from kitsune rush in the finals towards the end and like dallas few learned like how can to avoid it I, I i don't know if that's been said publicly but i know where you heard that from Oh, all right. Well, 
you know we certainly I'm got some we certainly got some juice this tournament all right i don't know well i know that people watch the game you know like if people yeah. can watch the game and see for themselves it's not like that was anything um, secret or anything you know you can fucking watch the game um but yes god damn now i lost the tournament i thought again um Yeah, overall. Houston the Allos show. top three? No, no. What, what what else did I wanted to say about the show here? Um, yeah, well, yeah. Okay, fair enough. We'll we'll see what to do. Anyway, they touched. <laughs> yeah, it was a striker thing. They did kind of get, get. I don't know. You you said credit to Krusty and like maybe he does deserve credit, but like they went into a tracer and a reaper meta and striker was their second man, so that that slid. I will. Um, all right, I, I'm, I'm going to share. I'm going to share some juice. All right, I'm gonna share some juice. Fuck it. All right, here we go. Fuck so, uh, I was one of those people. I was one of those people when Shock Sign Striker that was like, all right, let's see it, because I'm fucking tired. I'm fucking tired <laughs> of just like the Striker being picked up, and I didn't know if he got it after the Boston Uprising whole thing again. He played pretty poor for the Boston Uprising. You know, maybe the Soldier meta. I remember, like, the Soldier flank meta with the, the damage passive, whatever, with, like, movement speed. It was, like, ridiculous. Maybe that wasn't Striker's meta. You know, maybe it was a bad scenario. Um, certainly, it's a different environment from the Shock to begin with. But the juice is that, you know, Striker and the Shock, they didn't really have a perfect 2021. You know, there were a bit ups and downs um, for that team. Striker ended up leaving in the middle of the season. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that's quite understandable. Like that's public. Everyone kind of knows that like shocking 2021, it was a bit of an off year for them and they had a bit of a tumultuous things for them. The juice I heard though, is that striker is reformed and that, wow. that is awesome to hear, uh, for me because, you know, apparently, you know, understandably there were some emotions ran high in the shock last year and, you know, they couldn't really find their groove. Um, and so striker ended up going elsewhere, but from the moment striker came back to the team this year the juice was that he was an awesome teammate and he was yeah. he did really good and he was part of what made this san francisco shock team great and that really changed my perception of how i view striker as well so striker you know he's had it's um a, a, a bit of a tumultuous player career now like starting on boston and going to shock and then retiring back to boston retiring again back to shock like you look at that and you're like what is going on here like this is this is all over the place like this guy seems erratic but the juice is that like striker is reformed and he was an awesome teammate and he really helped shock go this far in the playoffs and i give him a lot of props for that because that's difficult to do so being able to transform into a great teammate um, while well, Timothy needs to be paying some of the best Overwatch I've seen him do. Like, he has some real impact moments as well. I'm just really happy for Striker. So there's the juice, all right? Um, it's easy to just, like... It's easy, especially, like, the community sometimes. They look at headlines and, like, take it, things for face value without understanding what's going on behind the scenes. And so having an opportunity to, like, just tell how awesome of a teammate Striker was and how impactful he was for the Shock team, I think it's important for the way we think about Striker in the future as well. I know that his situation hasn't been ideal all the time and it's been all over the place, but um for um for striker to have this run with this team again on this on, on the shock and being awesome while at it, massive props to striker. That's awesome, dude. Well, well that's a great story too. So we'll see what's in store for striker, but I'm happy for the guy. Um and good things coming out of coming out of there. So there we go. Finally a little finally a little positive story to share about the shock before we move on. Anyway Yay! Houston Outlaws, Woo. top three. I did not expect this. This was, if you told me this before the tournament, I would have been like, I do not believe you. But yeah. another great run in the playoffs. Houston Outlaws securing top three for the first time since 2018. Uh, I want to see where we put them in the, the pick and bracket. Jesus Christ. In our pick and bracket, they went out they were, to... I thought they were like top four, top six. Didn't we put them? Wait, how does this work? One, two, three... Four, yeah, five, six, five, yeah. six, losing to Atlanta. <laughs> okay, Aww. so that, yeah, it feels bad. Well, yeah, it, oh, yeah, here's the thing I kind of want to just disrespect Houston again because I just have all <laughs> their fans in my mentions just really <laughs> talking about how we disrespect Houston Outlaws, and then people were saying that we're just like not giving Houston enough credit. And I just don't understand any of their perspectives or where they're coming from because 
I feel like we gave Houston a lot of props. You need to give them props and respect yeah. for what they accomplished in these playoffs. They came third. They finally broke the mold and performed well in playoffs. That's the one thing that we've been asking for this team is they have played well in the regular season. They've been winning matches that they should win with the roster they have. But in the playoffs, they went sixth, eighth, and sixth or something like that. Like they just did not perform every time we played at a LAN or in a tournament. But they finally did it. Uh, surprisingly as well, off the back of Dante Winston, uh, they came into the playoffs playing some Roadhog, playing some Marissa, trying different things, but then slowly realized that they just have to play the Winston. And somehow Dante just keeps doing it. Uh, I don't think he was the world's greatest Winston of all time, but he did his job very well. And I think he tried to stay alive as well, providing space. And then, you know, as much as we always talk about Pelican, Merritt had a great playoffs as well on that Sojin. He is one of the best Sojins that we have in this league. Maybe not as consistently flashy in terms of just getting opening picks as like proper and shy, but he always gets like multiple final blows. It feels like in every single team fight. So um, I, I think you need to give massive credit to the Houston Outlaws. They finally like did the thing that was promised. Uh, they had a great run uh, in a meta that you wouldn't think would align with them. So massive props to the coaching staff as well. So. Uh, I'm excited to see what the Houston Outlaws do next season uh, or with the roster that they have because they obviously have great pieces. Um, but I remember there was all that drama with Pelican and Piggy earlier in the season. Are they going to double down and keep Dante on tank? You know, that is a gamble. Does Dante want to stay on tank? If I be like, Piggy, come back, Piggy. We, we need yeah. you, Piggy, yeah. come on. Let's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, we rerun. And then, that's it. Like, there's Team so back many... together. <laughs> there's so many weird questions that you have to ask for this Houston Outlaws squad. But in the moment you got to be proud of what they've done. Uh, as I said, if, this feels like a long time coming uh, for the Houston Outlaws that they finally had that playoff performance deservance of top three. This doesn't feel like Houston... I don't feel like Houston Outlaws will go back to Dante on DPS just at the caliber of play from Pelican and Mera, especially over the year. I don't but know it's if not you always agree. up to them. It's up to players as well, right? Definitely, definitely. But if it's like a situation where Dante's like, yeah, I actually don't mind playing tank. I actually quite enjoy it, you know? Like... I don't think they're going to be like, no, nah, you should go back to DPS and, you know, maybe you do all kind of stuff you in here and there because his tank performances have been so good this year. Yeah. Dante, like, my God, we haven't seen too many players like transcend roles uh, or like off roles, I should say, like Dante has. I mean, Mira played three roles uh, which is the first of any player in the Overwatch League. He played support damage and tank back in Overwatch 1. I think that was in 2020. I can't remember. I think it was 2020. But like he was the first player to do so. But he didn't look insane on the other roles. It was like, okay, you're a damage player. You're like a Doomfist player. You're an Echo player kind of thing. Like uh, flex DPS. But his eye was like pretty good. Um, but like... I don't think anybody has reached a level where Dante has reached on a, a role that's not their like main one. Um, yeah, I I can't name a single player really unless anybody else can kind of step in and think. But yeah, I think Dante has been like a crown jewel for the Outlaws this year. Because um, we all have questions like, how are they going to do it with only Piggy? And then when Piggy drops, like, well, okay, we just play Dante only. And it's like, holy shit, Dante's a beast. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, we, we said this as well, like, if, if you're a damage player, like, the league is just so packed with talent. Like, it's ridiculously hard to stand out as a damage player and be, like, top tier. There's only a handful of, like, or over two handfuls, I don't know how many that are, <laughs> that, the, the damage players that you're like, holy shit, that's incredible. So, it, realistically, yeah. if you're Dante and you're like, well, I want to play Tracer, I want to play, like, Sombra, um, hell, even Genji, if he picks up that. But, like, there is so much talent for, so the opportunity for you to stand out and, like, make a name for yourself and be a top tier in that role, it's just way harder. I think you, right, you're seeing right now in the league, there's, like, an opening, there's a demand for versatile tanks and i think we can all agree that dante he's like super sick on doom for example uh you know he's been good on some of these soft tanks for example i always bring up when he played diva against the shock i think it was in stage four with this like tracer sombra stuff early on like his diva looked good it looked way better than it did in goats and like 
his, his Winston, he only practiced it for a little bit. There's a real demand for tanks like Dante. So if you were to make a career decision, I would be like, you should probably commit to tank. And like, if you grind tank in the off season, improve upon your Winston, pick up the Reinhardt even, you know, shore up some stuff or maybe like Saria Diva, stuff like that. Like Dante genuinely has the hero pool to be a full-time tank next season. Like no joke, like full role transition. And so maybe if, you know, if Dante would like, you know, DM me on this channel was like, yo, dude, what do you think I should do for next year? I'd probably be like, yo, you should probably go tank. Like, I think you have yeah, way more job security. There's, there's more potential for you in your future career if you go tank here. And we're probably going to be in a scenario, you know, in two years, 2024, something like that, where like the next generation of tanks come up and you're like, oh my God, how do they play like Reinhardt on the level of like Hadi while well, at the same time? having like Doomfist and Saria and Junker Queen mechanics like no others. Like there's going to be that generation of tanks. This always happens in games, like adjusting to this kind of stuff, right? But Dante could be that like stopgap. He could be that guy that teams look to as like, this guy could be, this guy could shore up any question marks we have about the tank role and could do a great job for us. So um, with that, like huge, huge career tournament for Dante. Um, and like the, the, the opportunities for him are kind of like endless now. He doesn't even have to stay on the Outlaws, honestly. Um, you know, I know, I know he's been on the Outlaws now for like four or five years, but you know, if he wanted to go elsewhere and compete elsewhere, he certainly earned himself that um, opportunity now. There were times like on the Outlaws where they were so fucking bad in like 2020 or whatever. Yeah. Like, didn't they get eliminated by Boston he Uprising or something? Yeah, yeah they, they technically lost. came lost in the uh, 2020 playoffs. And so I don't care if you're like Dante and you're like, you have a brand, you're pretty popular and like, you look pretty good in your role. The opportunities of getting top three in the 2022 playoffs, it's just like way better for him, like moving on. Um, so uh, credit to, uh, I mean, Outlaws fans, they're like molding at me right now. Like, how can you say this shit? But like Dante, he's never been in a better position in his career ever. I'm willing to yeah. say that much. Um, so we'll see what he does, but yeah, um, the outlaws, uh, what, what, what around for them? I think on the topic as well of like, uh, outlaws not getting enough credit. I think, I think people sometimes, and like, no, this is no surprise. They read into the predictions too much in that regard because the, the predictions, right? They're so one dimensional, like either you pick Houston outlaws or you pick the other team. But then you look at some of these matchups, right? Like the first matchup against the Shock. Like the, 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 the correct answer from an analytical standpoint is predicting the Shock against the Outlaws. Outlaws yeah. ends up winning in map five. Then you have them going up against Lono Spitfire. And Lono Spitfire just looked amazing. They beat the LA Gladiators. And then you're fearless in an interview saying, oh, the Lono Spitfire might be the only team that can compete with us. Yeah. And Houston Outlaws, they like messed around on Roadhog for a little bit. You're like, okay, London probably is the right choice here. And then Houston 3 0s them. And then you're like, okay, well, do I predict Houston Outlaws against the number one seed Dallas Fuel, who's looked the best so far? You get the point. Like, yeah. I think a lot of Outlaws, Outlaws fans, they actually don't listen to the desk segment. They don't listen to the new ones. They don't listen to the props we're giving them. But just because we predict against them, and then you have the social media managers like piling on top of it, just like, oh, you're not predicting us. Haha, <laughs> funny, funny thing. You, don't, you predicted against us, and now you're wrong. Haha, <laughs> hold this L. Like, there's so many Outlaws fans who are just like, oh, you don't respect us. And it's like, no, we do. I think this is a 60-40 matchup, but because I predicted against the Outlaws, that's the only thing you're like reading into, and that's the only, the only thing you're basing this off. So it's a bit disingenuous in that regard. Um, I, I, I think we gave Outlaws plenty of props this tournament. I want to give my two cents on this thing. If you're, if you're tweeting at me or anything, or like you're, you're flaming us on Reddit and you have a Houston Outlaws flair or a thing, it's the same thing for any team, and you're saying that we're being biased against you or where that kind of stuff... We're not actually, we genuinely don't care about any specific team, but you are biased because you are a fan of that team against us for not talking about your team or anything like that. So I'm just, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not going to take anything you say seriously because you're passionate about your team. And that's fine. That's how sports are. But don't come at us because you think that we're not giving your team the perfect props. When I feel like in general, we are pretty balanced and... Uh, without we're talking to every team. I have people who say I'm a Dallas Fuel simp, and then I have people who say I'm a Dallas Fuel hater. There are literally two camps of people that say I'm the opposite of two spectrums with yeah. all these things. So it, it's easy to be biased when you're absorbed around your own team, around the things that we say. But I can promise you, I genuinely don't hate or like one team better than the others. Yeah. Just pure analysis. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing with the Dallas Fuel thing. Like, when we, we had that short segment on Platcher or whatever. Like, it was genuinely, like, a mistake for me. Like, you know, it was genuinely me. I jumped ahead in my, like, topic rundown or whatever. And uh, I, 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 you know, I forgot to mention them. And suddenly, Dallas Fuel fans, they interpret that as in, like, I hate the Dallas Fuel. I do not want to talk about the legitimate champion of this tournament. It's like, bro, <laughs> like, we, we, we run arguably, like, the biggest competitive Overwatch podcast in the space. Of course, we need to talk about the champions. It was a silly mistake. But it not, has nothing to do about me liking or disliking your team. The same for Houston Outlaws here. Um, someone in the chat was like, I'm still salty. My Houston Outlaws didn't get nominated for any postseason awards. Did, did Merritt not get nominated? Or Dante? Surely they had an MVP nominee, surely right? Surely Merritt got nominated for um, Rollstar. Yeah. Well, no, I don't think he didn't get nominated. Okay, and I also, I want to set this clear as well, because this is important. Most people voted for these role stars and all these things at the beginning of stage four, like even before we had really seen many matches, that's when the voting yeah. goes out. And that is really when Dallas, uh, sorry, Houston really started finding their success, right? Like if I had gotten to the end of stage four, I probably would have voted for Dante for role star tank because he gapped Hanbin on the Zaya. And then obviously he went and played the Winston. Like it is important to use the context of when the voting happened because there is a lot of things that changed within the stage four. So maybe the Overwatch League needs to look at their voting system better. And maybe we should finish all four stages before we start making these votes. Because some people don't have that context. Yeah. Well, they have to prepare a lot of things too. So there's like additional time between like voting, getting all the votes in, following yeah. people up because they've not voted, and then creating assets and videos and um, graphics and the trophies and the bat the pictures and the like the portrait well the, the little paint not painting sorry like prints that are framed but like, there's a lot that prints, kind of yeah. goes into that that's not like oh why didn't you just do it on the final day well like we'd give him a scrap of paper and we have no videos so here you go you know what i'm saying so uh yeah i mean maybe they'll end up doing it a little later down the line next year but that depends on format because this one is like well stage four happened and then we're just like well okay play-ins and now playoffs like there's not much gap there so yeah yeah uh, I, you know to, not to step on the format thing we'll talk more about the playoffs overall later but like that that play in thing i think was like almost like a linchpin i don't know if linchpin is the right word but like that was maybe the thing where i'm like ah eh, maybe we should have you know done this differently like playoff teams already practicing live and then playing teams playing playing and like that was just maybe give the teams an extra week to prepare with the new meta stuff like that um so merit did not get nominated for MVP on money or someone from the Houston Outlaws. But like looking oh. at this list, it's so stacked that I'm like, it is. Uh, it it's is. hard. And like some of these teams, they like achieved some more success than the Houston Outlaws prior to this point. Like Cesc got nominated, for example, from the Fusion. And like Fusion, they made the finals of the Kick of Clash in the Eastern region. They made top four at like mid season madness, right? And so they had that playoff success. Houston Outlaws, throughout most of the year, our story was like, they can't get it done in the playoffs. Like, they can't go far yeah. in these tournaments, right? So, regardless of the fact you had a good regular season, a lot of... Um, they had a pretty good... Did they have a good stage four as well? Were they one of those teams? Or did they have a bad? I can't remember. But the point being, like, up until the actual playoffs, like, Outlaws were good, but they were not, like, top three good. Like, they obviously shown in the playoffs. So, it's just one of those things, again, where it's like... You know, we, we didn't we didn't know that they would perform this well in the postseason. And now you could definitely make the case in hindsight that they should have been given more honors. But anyway, I think we were completely fair to the Houston Outlaws. I, there were many times I remember I remember vividly being on the desk many times, almost every outlaw segment yeah. and being like giving them props and being like, this is amazing. Right. This is great. This is the best result in forever. This is awesome. So I don't I don't feel bad a single little bit about not giving them enough props because i did i did give them tons of props and if you don't recognize that then you just it's just worth remembering just, johnny that people have very selective memory <laughs> yeah it's, um, it's not for certain events i by the oh, way i don't want to make this podcast was just ranting about the fan basis of teams that would not yeah, be yeah. a good first playoff uh, podcast ever. so maybe maybe pump the brakes a little bit but we're we're done talking about dallas fuel and we're done talking about outlaws so maybe it gets better from here and Chuck, so, you know, honestly, yeah, yeah, from here, good, honestly, we're honestly, we're just clear riding with the fans. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, the viewers are the just season podcast, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was actually really funny, the top three teams who made it in the end. Outlaws, Dallas, and San Francisco Shock. And at the same time, I think I saw on the Valorant subreddit, 
there was this thing they made like a clout rankings where like they measured <laughs> me um, uh, measured the clout of each team who's franchise now and like we we had our top three clout teams make the the top three which is hilarious yeah. that we had battle for texas ridiculous and two-time champion shock in there um you know i don't think the chinese audience agrees you know hangzhou and shanghai fans but the top three clout teams for the western region just made the top three i thought that was hilarious i think that was funny as fuck um but anyway uh all right moving on next i think it's only reasonable we talked about number one number two number three let's talk about the hangzhou spark making top four which i the 12th seed <laughs> Dude, let's go the 12th seed and we already mentioned shy's greatness but the fact that the madman actually did it they made top four i mean you can't this make this shit up was a hot fucking mess this year but yeah. Every time they got to an international tournament, they're like, you know what? We ain't fucking around no more. Very fortunate that Shai could play Sojin in both of those metas. And Sojin True. was just the most important hero in the game at that situation. And Shai went single mode. But we've already talked about that. Shai's incredible. He's one of the best hit scans we have in the league, if not the best. Um, it's impressive that they made it this far because... I don't think we saw a couple of the pieces stepping up in the way that we did. Gushway coming back playing very well, having that Winston style that's very oppressive, giving Shy that space, Teru picking up the Kiriko. And like, I don't agree with everything Teru did on Kiriko. He was uh, hyper aggressive some point to a fault. Dude, too much sometimes. So, way too much sometimes. But he played a very different style, very aggressive, did get a lot of damage in, but I think it cost him in healing some from time to time. But honestly, you... you you need to be happy for what uh, the Hongzhou Spark did. We got a little bit of Changun effect where they just played Pineapple for one series. No context given. After he comes in for map five, wins, and then Pineapple is never seen again, uh, except for on that one Circuit Royale. So it's like, I don't know. It, it's a cool run for Hongzhou Spark. I'm, I'm happy for them. Uh, they were definitely the team that I think overachieved the most compared to where I thought they were going to be. Yeah. I don't think anybody expected them to like take a map off the Dallas Fuel and also just completely demolish the Dragons on the face of it all. I think the Spark the spark and the Shock's story of going through the lower bracket is insane. Like, it kind of adds to the idea that this is the best playoffs we've ever had. Two teams that got knocked to the lower bracket and made almost a complete run-through of... Uh, of lowers to make it almost to the finals. Obviously, Shock completed that. Shock had to knock out the Spark, who also was completing the run. So I think regardless of who won in that Shock versus Spark series, it would have been sick. Um, and maybe Spark would have beat Houston. Not sure about that one. They didn't actually play each other at all in that tournament. That would have been a kind of interesting match, I think, just how well Spark were playing. Um, yeah, dude. Insane, insane run. And it's funny because I mentioned it on the broadcast, I remember, or at least going into the game. Me and Rose kind of talked about it. I'm like, this team's fucking crazy for this meta. Like, Gushway, one of the best Winstons we have, and then Shy being able to play Sojourn, and Sojourn being so good at this point in time in the meta. Like, Jesus Christ, man. Like, you almost don't expect it, because you're like, eh, it's the spot. They came in at number 12, but like, Man, I'm so happy they did so well. And I think a lot of other teams were, oh, sorry, a lot of their fans and people out there were too. I think, and I tweeted out actually during the event, Spark are one of the most fun teams to watch in the playoffs uh, at that time. Like seeing Gushway, Primal Rage people, like Primal Blading, and then seeing Shy just mm, boop, one shot, one shot, one shot, one shot, just like his incredible aim was just, oh man, I don't know, man. They were fun as fuck to watch. Yeah. I'm Dude, so happy they got that far. Think about this as well, though. We were one map away from the spark going out first round to the Toronto Defiant. Like that that's how close we were to With just not seeing tank. any more shy. And like we With would be talking about tank. this D for this team in a completely different context. But they just managed to etch out against Toronto and then they make that run eliminating Florida and London. Like crazy. Now I will say, as much as we do give Hongzhou a lot of props and shy, I do not think that they played 
the toughest opponents throughout this throughout their run right they went through toronto florida and london fair like there's like gladiators london, in seoul up here and then it's florida london down here yeah that's it right so it's like florida obviously florida and london have been playing well and toronto you know had had their moments and everything so i'm not taking anything away from those teams but they didn't beat down any juggernaut teams uh and sure. i didn't really think about that until i what looked at this uh bracket right here so yeah but, you know props need to go to them they're still nuts yeah, uh, co completely agree. Um, at the same time, though, like Devil's Advocate, like London took down the Gladiators in the upper bracket, and London yep. looked really good. Um, and I think, if anything, like Florida Mayhem, you know, they had Hydron on their roster, one another great Sonya player as well. Florida Mayhem, like I casted that series, they should have won that push map and made it to top uh, to map five. And yeah. then control, like, who knows what happens. It was a bit of a throw from the Florida Mayhem. So, I don't know. I, I, I feel like looking at this bracket, Florida Mayhem would be the only opponent. I guess they're not refined too. So, yeah, I, I, they, they had an easier road. But I don't want to make it out like, oh, you know, they just... They got, like, a super easy road. Not at all. Like, yeah. the, the, these teams were all good. Um, there is no easy road. <laughs> there's no easy road. Yeah, especially in the playoffs. Um. Really happy that Hanshaw Spark fulfilled their potential and got top four. Also really happy that the Awards League playoff format is fucking sick. And yeah. th that allowed Hanshaw Spark to make this run in the first place. Like, there are so many other Premier Esports and obviously League of Legends, you know, that was at the forefront. I was going to say, with, Johnny, please say it. Just say it. Just say it. Everybody knows who you're thinking about right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think... I think they're 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 smart. Like they're smart people in charge of the esports uh, uh, at World of, uh, World, of, World of Warcraft. No, <laughs> League of Legends worlds. Uh, <laughs> and like, I understand their reasoning for why they have singular limb bracket in many ways. Like it's beneficial to some areas of the broadcast. It's beneficial to, um, in a lot of different reasons. So I I, I don't think that there's this there's this one sided argument where double limb is is like the best by far but i'm happy that we as a league that we've decided to do double limb for this playoffs and we invite so many different teams and like there's so many different personalities so many different teams many different play styles all fan bases get involved it's not like eight teams in a singular limb and then your team is out and you're like oh fuck my team is out i don't know if i want to keep watching like the fact that we invited so many teams and we have double limb it it allowed for these storylines to happen and it allowed for teams like the Hangzhou Spark with Shy at the forefront, an absolute superstar on Sojourn to make this big run in the lower bracket. And then we had Shy versus Proper in the lower bracket semifinal. Like this is a legendary stuff. Like I'm so happy that our format allowed for these matches to take place and for these storylines to happen. Because there are a lot of other esports that have great stories and you know they you know single limb still works out for them. But I just love our format. It suits our esports and it suits what we're doing. And we, we couldn't have asked for a better better playoffs in this regard. So like like you remember the fucking 2020 playoffs <laughs> where we had two play in brackets in each region and then the top two we would travel to Korea and there was like four teams to play a double lane bracket. Yeah. Like and then like Philly, we just knew Philly like Philly were just bad. So yeah. then the became after the metal switch, by the way. After the meta switch by Fusion, yeah. that was one of the best rosters of all time. And then the meta changed and they got shafted and got fourth in the playoffs. But um, obviously, COVID, um, the, the amount of tech they went through, the amount of like fucking problem solving the league went through to make that happen in the first place, to like during almost peak COVID, have teams travel to Korea and have them play from the hotel room. Amazing achievement. But for playoff purposes, like it was half-ass kind of solution it was not what we we're looking for this right here this playoffs right here with the double lm the amount of teams we invited this is the real shit right here this is this was fucking awesome so yeah i'm really happy hangzhou spark had to pop off you know and we got to see what they're made of and we don't have to end this playoffs with like oh the hangzhou spark you know the changun you know all this shit um but just it just like Double elimination provides big narratives that thing like that like do that. If we had single elimination, San Francisco Shock use lose to the Houston Outlaws, and that's the end of the San Francisco Shock season. Like there's double elimination exists so that you don't just lose to one team, and that's the end of your season in a lot of ways. Yeah, you can talk about doing group stages, but I think group stages are more boring than doing double elimination. And I think that there are a lot of matches that don't seem to have impact. So well, you we either need to do group stage or double elimination to add uh I guess rails so that teams don't just get eliminated out of one match um and i think double elimination is the better uh, setup
the grand finals would have been Dallas versus Outlaws, which also would have been a maybe scenario anyway. But yeah, it would have been pretty shitty. <laughs> Let's be real. Like double elimination is always more hype. Um, I think the amount of time we kind of fit in all the games, it didn't feel rushed or anything. Or I did. I personally didn't feel like. Oh man, I've cast in so much. Holy fuck! Like, um, or anything like that. I think the way it's run right now should continue in later years. Like this bracket, what we had, regardless of teams, double elimination in the span of time that we had. Maybe doing it on a weekend would have been great. You know, Saturday, Sunday, but um, Worlds finals is on then, so kind of makes sense why they couldn't do it. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, keep this format. It's very epic. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Makes cool storylines, you know. Yeah. Seeing Spark make their run, seeing Shock make their run, etc. Very epic. The count, the counter argument is just like the more, the more matches you have, the more it dilutes the importance of the matches. So obviously, like group play, tons of matches going on. You never feel like the real importance of the game itself. Like, oh, I don't know how important this game is. It's hard for me to like, you know, place that emotional importance on the game and enjoy it more. Double elim bracket. Yes, they have an extra life. I know that, that my team has an extra life. Therefore, I value this game more. Single limb, it's either win or go home. Holy shit, this match is so fucking important for my team. If we lose, we're out. So, so there is that degree of like importance, but I just feel like double limb is like the, the, the most optimal solution to that problem in that regard. So can you yeah. imagine if the Overwatch League just announced, oh yeah, we're just going to do a top eight single limb and it's going to be over two days. I hope everyone enjoys like... That's not what you guys want. Like, you would get a lot less Overwatch. That's it rough. would be a lot less hype. It would be no competitive advantage. Yeah. So, yeah, that's just not how it would work. I will say it's interesting, like, how, you know, we might as well just do this topic now. Like, we've already been on about the formats, and we're wrapping up this topic anyway. So, but, you know, how Worlds, they have, like, a week break before their finals. It allowed for that mm -hmm. finals matchup to kind of, like, simmer a little bit, and, like, people to think about it, get hyped. Obviously, they had sensational, like content leading into that as well so it kind of allowed people to get hyped about it we've had that long break leading into finals before an excruciatingly long wait sometimes for 2018 2019 don't want that but i do think it's interesting like if we did it on two weeks so we'd have like you know part of this bracket like played on one weekend and then the next weekend you'd have like i don't know from from like lower bracket quarterfinals or lower bracket semifinals onwards like a separate weekend because that allows that top four top six to be like yo this is the top six weekend. This is going to be sick. So, um, yeah, I, no, I, I yeah. agree. I, I, I think, we'll I think you could, you could definitely split it up over weekends to like make it more hype. Uh, I think, like, I don't even think this is like needed to be that much of a discussion uh, with the double elimination, because if you don't agree with double elimination, just look at how everyone else does it. And that's just the way it is because esports has been going for way longer than the Overwatch League. Yeah. <laughs> um, just in case you're not aware, this has been a tried and tested situation. Uh, secondly, I think the bigger issue of this whole play playoffs is really the playoff patch. And obviously, yes, yes. That is something that, you know, we've talked about in the past and like people have spoken about and, you know, I can give it a pass for this year, but how many times throughout, how many playoffs have we had where we've just given it a pass? Like it needs to stop happening with Overwatch 2 being on a more rigorous schedule of like heroes coming out patches and stuff like that. The playoffs needs to be set in a time where the teams have enough time to effectively practice so we get the best teams at the right time in a meta and it doesn't come down to who guesses the right meta or who works out the meta because they only have five days to work it out. A hundred percent. That is 100%. really the big thing that needs to be uh, prioritized in fixing going into next year. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, now when we actually have the battle pass feature as well, where, you know, uh, every season is going to be like, what, two months? I mean, it's... Uh, nine weeks. Nine weeks. And I think they've announced like the, the content rotation for like all that shit. So like, yeah. by, by all means, like you should be able to figure out when new shit is going to drop and plan ahead for those circumstances to make, to, to sort of like plan the competitive integrity around the new content being dropped in Overwatch 2. Like we shouldn't be in a scenario anymore where we're like, oh, uh, th there's a patch coming this way and we're not really like, we haven't scheduled for that. And like you get into this like weird territory, but... This is the best you could ask for. Like the, the schedule or like the content rotation, we know it. So like be able to plan around it, make sure yeah. the competitive integrity is there. Um, there. There should be no excuses from this point on. So I, I agree with you in that regard. 
um as i said before i don't think i don't want like a long break before the playoffs but i do think that that play in week like that extra week of play for some of these teams that is uh, like a week i could just like cut out slice out of the planning and be like give these teams an extra week to figure out the meta to practice and then they have like maybe three weeks two to th three weeks with a meta on their hands to figure out going into the playoffs i know that's not optimal i know some of these teams they want as much time to, as possible to prepare for the meta they probably were like yo give us a month and i'm like a month i can't like as can't a fan a as a fan you i can't, can't give you a no. month to prepare There's no way yeah and um i think the sweet spot is two weeks if you give teams two weeks to put, like all be there and practicing and set i think that is the perfect scenario and i think as long as you the league is doing stuff in that time to like hype it up and stuff like that i think that's that's the perfect world that you can get into yeah teams know two weeks in advance and that they can practice for two weeks yeah and um you know then the, then the other topic as well would be like it depends on how major the changes are like we got a new hero and we had changes on top of that to like sorry and stuff and the, someone told me about this the other day sorry I, you know i don't want to say your name because uh i don't, I don't know whatever um anyway that just reminded me as well that um fuck what did it remind me of oh my god uh, i'm i'm it's lost in this sauce i'm so green. tired but that um shit guy <laughs> 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 fuck what the fuck is happening i don't know what's happening but that um yeah we had changes on top of the hero release uh and so like we just had like a fucking major just like huge this was uh, uh, no the, the point was that like retail they didn't even play the same patch as us they they're not playing oh, with the sorry yeah. changes right they're not playing with the sorry changes so this was all for naught we're just like we're gonna wait for overwatch 2 and then we can play the people can play the game they're watching and then we didn't even do that because they didn't have the same patch as us and yeah. so we're just fucking all over the place so people jump into ranked and they're like why is there sorry in my games when the overwatch is all about winston so yeah it's yeah. Yeah, it's just fucking all over the place. Um, so yeah, that was a very weird patch timing, and also yeah, the communication of the patch as well was very. Well, they've said that they, that's not how they wanted it to be, right? Like, yeah, they, they, they said that uh, with, the, with the law going on with all those issues that they fell behind on their stuff, and that they actually, in general, want to have that mid-season patch come through around four weeks, four weeks in. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, we're at like week six or something like that, and we still haven't got the patch. Yeah. Uh... I think they said they wanted to get it out earlier, but they ran into some issue. So yeah, yeah best case scenario it would have been the same thing, but tech issues or whatever came in the way. So um, there you go. I think that's long enough about the format. We've we've beaten this to death. Um, there you go. But hopefully, hopefully next year is gonna be safe. Good job, Shy and Hongjo. Good job, Shy and Hongjo. Good job, let's um, go. Oh, final thoughts. Really happy for Gushui. Really yeah. happy for Gushui. Yeah. That's all I'll say. What a fucking performance by Gushui. The primal Legend. bait is back in Anaheim. That was an awesome, funny storyline. Good meme as well throughout the playoffs. Love that as well. Um, you know, he, he had a pretty rough season. Didn't see a ton of play time when Gushui came in throughout the season. He didn't have the best of performances like on Dorado and stuff like that. So for him to just have a sick playoffs as well, I'm really happy for that guy. Gushui... Gushue is almost like a forgotten about underrated like historic player in the league as well like that guy has been around for a long time has insane name, name value one of the most popular Chinese players in the league and so I'm re just really happy that he found success he he's an he's an awesome player to follow so good for him okay I will say this Gushue is one of those players I'm glad he had that success but I'm worried about Gushue because I feel like he is one of those players who does not have the flexibility and mechanics to play the off tanks in a way that he'll be that like massively first time. I think that's the way that Overwatch 2 is going. So I'm curious to see what Gushu is going to do or if he's going to prove, prove me wrong with that. Cause he, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Johnny. I haven't been super impressed from anything other than his Winston. I mean, they made top four in GOATS meta. So I think that speaks to his Reinhardt as well. But yes, barring that, I don't know what his breaking ball is like, you know, something yeah. like that. So. <laughs> I, so we'll see. Yeah. I think there's a lot of tank players who I'm kind of curious. I'm kind of curious to see how the tank role changes and evolves going into next season. Because I think some teams and players showed that the value of having one player who is hyper flexible is more valuable than having the two. Yeah, um, for sure. From meta to meta. Yeah, I, I think we're slowly going to face over to that. Um, but I, I, think, I think that players like Gushway, who has insane name value and is also good at Winston and I'd say Reinhardt as well, I think they have like one more year of getting a pass of like a freebie like hey we want a kind of like main tank specialist on our team just in case 
you know, just in case metas like this happens, where it's like we need a Winston player de uh, desperately and Ushua can step into that. But after 2023, if you don't have any flexibility, I'm sorry. I don't, I, you're going to have a tough time finding a spot in this league. So, so yeah, Gushue definitely has something to prove in 2023 if he continues to play. Uh, you know, we're, we don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, but, um, but yeah, I'm happy for him. Legendary player. I'm happy he popped off. So there you go. Um, yeah. Anyway, Hangzhou Spark. Good for you guys. Good, good Winston. Love to see it. This is a heartbreaking topic, guys. Especially for us here at Patch at LLC. LLC, what happened? Did we have higher I mean, hopes for Soul Dynasty? The, the team we predicted to win it all. Well, Joss and Costa, you don't really do. Joss, you kind of joined in on me and Avast with the I was the pushing Smurf the Smurf heads down. Well, yeah. they did. It was, Soul did make it further than the Glads. So I'm never okay, going well, to allow you never gonna allow right now. We're talking about Soul Dynasty, okay? Let's not. Okay, let's keep the Glads out of our mouth for right now. It All was right. it, it was disappointing. Um, Soul was one of those teams that we had heard were playing different things going into the playoff. Uh, they should have been good in this meta. Can't tell you why they're not. Um, they just did not really have the coordination. Uh, Fitz didn't really pop off in the same way on Sojin. They had like they lost their first series to Dallas Fuel and were like, "That's it, Prophet, you're on Kiriko," which didn't make any sense to me. It didn't look that great against San Francisco Shock. Like a band aid fix. Yeah, like obviously, Soul like... Dynasty did lose to the Dallas Fuel and then went to Lobrack and then lost to the San Francisco Shock. You need to keep that in context, okay? But also in context, they got three zero rolled by pretty much both of those teams. So it's like it wasn't like they were close. Uh, yeah. So it was just a disappointing performance from them, uh, especially seeing the meta should have been good for them. Like all of their players should have been comfortable on the roles that they were playing. But yeah, maybe a misread on the meta, maybe something like that, but just did not perform well. I, I'm just going to say it, right? I, I, we heard, well, I don't know about you guys, but I heard from multiple sources. I talked to multiple people that Soul didn't initially like really conform to this Winston, Winston composition. Like that was not their primary. They did not expect Winston to be this prevalent in the playoffs. And so there were genuinely like a lot of Soul fans like on the timeline and stuff like that who were just like, what happened to Soul? They just completely fell flat. The answer is they didn't practice these Winston compositions as much as other teams. Um, and they didn't yeah. expect it to sort of go this way. And the rumor was that they were actually seeing a lot of success before the Reaper came into the mix. You know, when teams were playing more Tracers, stuff like that, um, before Dallas Fuel picked up the Reaper, the Soul was actually a really good team. And then the meta sort of like shifted away from them um, and they just had less practice time on the Winston composition. And so, you know, they, they have, I don't know why they went in a different direction, but, you know, they have Smurf, who's a fantastic Winston, Prophet, for example, like all of this stuff, right? So I don't know why they went in a different direction, but yes a, a mystery a misread on the meta was the primary reason why soul didn't really live up to potential in that regard so they misfired bad read um sucks man kind of fell flat but yeah that's it's kind of insane that soul have still not won any like grand finals or like a, a humongous Second in like, was the closest yeah yeah like that to me, then, that like, was a weird my... one. that was a weird run <laughs> yeah i'm like my god gesture roadhog flower shop <laughs> like are we gonna get to a point in time where we're like a hundred look because i was also kind of on that train like i did get converted to the smurf head way of uh, mindset but like i don't know have i lost faith maybe i have actually just a little bit this team always looks so good and they have the goat in profit but where's the dubs bro where are they like they're just nowhere to be found i just don't get it yeah, I'm like, what? Everything points to this team doing extremely well. And then it's like, well, where is the results for that? Yeah, they got beaten by Dallas Fuel and the Shock. I would have liked to see Soul Dynasty play against the Houston Outlaws to kind of see where that match would have gone. If they'd have gotten whooped there too, bruh. Like, thank maybe thank God we didn't see that match. Because if they got 3 0 by Houston Outlaws, I'd have been even more disappointed. It's. I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I, I've lost faith in Seoul a little bit here. And uh, I think that will kind of continue for me until they stand up and be like, no, we're one of the best teams in the world right now. Like, I don't know. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but like my disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined. Yeah. I want to talk about something. All right. Sorry, Johnny. 
No, I was just uh, going to because... say, you, you look at the bracket, and the only team they beat was Florida Mayhem, and then they lost 6-0. Yeah, yeah. Then, it, they, then they got like, wrong. Just observation, real quick. Yeah, yeah. It, so here's something that like I've heard that is an interesting point of... I've heard that it's very difficult for the APAC teams to stay at the same level as the teams in the West. Yeah. Because they have less teams to effectively practice with. Um, there is only seven teams in the East that have Overwatch League, full Overwatch League caliber. Yes, they have Korean contenders and stuff like that. But I've heard, especially after the O2 Blast, Struck sort of like dismantled the O2 Blast. It isn't as strong as it used to be in terms of like screaming contenders teams. Um, so there's only seven teams in the East. One of them is the Los Angeles Valiant. The other one is the Chengdu Hunters. So like two teams that are very strange in the way that they play the game and just like not always viable, uh, effective practice. And I've heard that they've been struggling to come up with metas and determine the metas because there are less teams to work with and work from in comparison to the West where you have a very strong set of teams at the top end who are scrimming each other, who are bouncing off each other that play the game, I guess, the right way. Uh, and, you know... <laughs> That could be one of the major factors of why Soul Dynasty struggled. Of as I said, in the East, they were probably all scrimming each other. They came to this conclusion of Winston Tracer, then Soul started playing that Roadhog, and then you're like, oh great. And then all of a sudden, with like five days to go until the playoffs start, you scrim against Dallas Fuel, probably the best team in the West, and they're playing Winston Reaper, and they're just way better than you at it. And like they counter what you've done, so you've just had a hard misread on the meta. No one in your region also caught that as well. And that's what puts them at a detriment. So obviously that is not, you, that's not an only excuse of like, oh, that's why they suck, right? Like that's not a defense to, against all dynasty, but it's something you need to keep in mind when you talk about these teams that they are playing in, at the, at the end of the day, a weaker region and they don't have as much effective practice. Dude. Yeah. Oh man. I'm like, I've always been a fan of like splitting regions in a way. And then they come together at various points within the year and then the playoffs or whatever, but having the disparity between teams is like the number of teams between the two regions. is like, bro, that fucking blows. Like, Do you really think oh it's just the, the sheer number of teams though? I think it's quite evident that the Western region have the best teams. They have the most stacked No, teams. I, I think it's number of teams. I think if you went 10 10, I think the number yeah. of people that you can scrim off of. And like, obviously, when if we did a 10 10 split, it would be, we would hope that a couple of the good ones would also be there as well. Um, but I just, I think it, it, it I think it's a higher likelihood of having scrim and like get yeah. effective, meaningful practice yeah. um, in the same way because 13 of the best teams that exist in the world, you can't scrim against and you have seven in your region including yourself and as i said one of those is the los angeles valley so yeah. you can't the the realistic outcome of like having completely even across the board in terms of number of teams is that there will be the top teams and then the middle teams and the lower teams like that will all even out uh, across the board like i don't see a reality where like you know, you have your MYXL Titans and stuff. Um, that kind of caliber of team also exists. Like you, the balance of power will eventually kind of even out uh, if you do have 10 teams on each side. I just really wish that was the case. But like logistically and like all the, th this is like out of control of like 99% of people because this is like just going down to how the league is like operated and ran um so i don't think we'll ever kind of get that back the other obviously solution there is if you can't get a 10 and 10 you have every team 20 teams back in the western region and then you play like which is also not possible at this point right there's a ton of things that kind of go into it i just I do wish there was an equal number yeah. of teams. On I say side. a lot of shit on this podcast, but that's genuinely one of the problems where I'm like, I have no thoughts on the split and I cannot tell you what they should do or how it should be done. Well, yeah. let's be realistic. When they're talking about the split, the least, the thing that the league cares the least about is the effective practice that the, the APAC team is getting. Yeah. I'm sure it's a lot easier for scheduling and all that kind of stuff. And if there was a solution to it, it would be getting done. But uh... there isn't a solution. Yeah, we're obviously in a tight place because of the way that the league is formatted and just functions yeah. as a whole that was built back in 2019. And that was when we were all in one place and we were planning on flying around the world. And now we are not in one place and we do not fly all over the world. So now we're in this kind of like awkward scenario. Yeah. 
Yeah, and even if you're the most the, the most hopium copium Korean contenders fanboy, <laughs> this is just like what we've heard from the teams themselves. This is not all yeah. speculation. Like, you, you, yeah. yeah, is... People love to like shit on our points, but like, well, this is literally things that we've heard from the APAC region team. So yeah. you know where you know we have insight. <laughs> yeah, this this is this is how it is. This is the unfortunate scenario. I mean. <laughs> even like we're gonna wrap up this point but like just lo thinking about the apac region you're like if you're shanghai and seoul and you're trying to practice let's say fusion are having a bad time because they've been oscillating all over the place spark is doing spark things yes you said you have chengdu doing chengdu things and then you have the valiant and charge you're just like who do we practice out of these teams for the most efficient practice possible? And then let's say you're the San Francisco Shock and you're like, well, we can practice Dallas Fuel, Houston Outlaws, Atlanta Rain, uh, <laughs> hell, even like Toronto to find some of these mid-table teams. Like there's, there's blocks to fill out. You can fill out your blocks like pretty easy with elite practice time, right? So it's just, you know. It also can't be understated of even if there are the four teams in the bottom end that you don't scrim very often, every now and then they come out with a banger comp. Oh, like they're just, they throw something at a wall and they come out with something. And that's just like stuff that you don't have to deal with for the most part. But then every now and then you can take from them as well. So it's like, it's, it, it's just an advantage. 13 teams, 12 teams to scrim against against six. Like you literally have twice as many teams that you can effectively scrim against at the Overwatch League level. Even though the bottom end of APAC is probably better than the bottom end of NA, if that's how you want to talk about it, it's still more teams. Like, double the teams. It's just better. Serious upset. Sorry about that, audio listeners. Uh, but yes, there we go. Wrapping up that topic. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess for the Seoul Dynasty, that's... I mean, it sounds like an excuse, and I guess it kind of is, but like, they had a misread on the meta, and it all kind of fl fell in part in the playoffs for them. It sucks that it's happened, mm. but... It sucks so bad. Yeah, like I'm not, I'm not here to play what if games. Like, what if they actually played Winston from the start? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had them winning the thing. It was a bit of a mean pick, but at the same time, with Murph and Prophet at the helm, like maybe that's what they could have done. Prophet was playing Reaper, and like Reaper is one of those heroes that has less skill expression compared to, for example, Sojourn. Right. So it's one of those points where like your your best damage player is not on the role that is having the most impact on the game. Like that that kind yeah. that kind of sucks for you too, right? So it sucks for the Soul Dynasty, not their tournament, not their meta, and that's pretty much all there is to it. I will say this fucking this this fucking profit on Kiriko thing. That I this this we the 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 Jotes meta and profit playing Brig opened fucking Pandora's box when it came to flex, profit on flex support. Because yeah. by God, we've now seen him on Ana, a single map, mind you, on, on New Queen Street for Soul Dynasty as well in Stage 4. He subbed in on Kiriko, it, you know, when they were just like having an emergency meeting about what they should do in a meta they haven't really practiced that much. I, this has to stop, all right? I don't care if you're Prophet, legitimately the greatest player of all time. You have to stop thinking that you can fill in this flex support role because it's not the answer like it's it's not not a thing that should be on the actual like coaching table of the, as like options to do especially like in the middle of a playoffs it's just it just ain't it like let there's a massive mistrust in your flex support yeah right? of like th oh, this yeah. is the second time that profit has come in and said and sort of beam right that's like, I can do your job better than you can. And, you know, you can argue that he probably can, but it, that is very difficult. And I'm actually curious to see how that will affect the Soul Dynasty and Iris on that team moving forward. If, yeah. like, that was a, if, if that Iris, was a thing. Of, yeah, if it, oh, that's yeah, it, like, definitely. Prophet come, came out of that series and the coaching staff came out of that series against Dallas Fuel and pretty much just by looking at their sub sort of pointed at Iris and said, we think that we cannot win with you playing Kiriko and benched him and put Prophet, someone who had probably no experience in scrims under the Kiriko and put Stalker in. And Stalker was great. And Prophet Kiriko was fine, but it didn't seem a major difference over here. So that's a big thing to do to a player where you bench someone for someone with an off roll. Trust me, I know it hurts. Yeah. Uh, so it, Your like- Motivation it, it, was just- Yeah, sink. that's it. it it's, it's, it's hard when you have teammates who don't, or, and, or coaching staff that don't trust in your ability to do your job. Um, that weighs on you. So 
Uh, we'll see if that, if that affects him in the future. And, it, you know, uh, well, one excuse would be, well, like we saw Tiru, for example, play on the Kiriko. Like we've seen damage players like sub into his role. That's still a horrible coaching decision to like do it in the middle in of the playoffs. Of support. You should do this like as soon as Kiriko is released. You should figure out who your permanent Kiriko player is from the get-go. Like not during the playoffs. Like this shouldn't have been on the table at the moment it was, right? So... If anything, that is the thing that molded me the most. Um, and I, I, I really think, like, I could definitely have seen, like, when the playoff patch hit, that, hey, what would our team look like if we put Profit on Kiriko, a sort of, like, flank-heavy kind of damage flexible, yeah, and we had yeah. Stalker coming in, and Stalker, who's a fantastic player. On paper, theoretically, great roster. It makes sense. Oh, yeah. But you should have this figured out before the shit even starts, all right? And not during the tournament itself. And if you tried it out and it kind of worked and you still, like, retorting to this idea during the playoffs, that's also a terrible coaching decision. So this was just the fucking worst thing possible to sub in profit on Kiriko. Like, there's no way about it. It was just genuinely terrible. Um... Coach, like, stylistic matchup? No, like, I don't buy it in any single kind of, like, reasoning whatsoever. So, yeah, that was just straight up... Like, the only defense is, like, oh, Iris was feeling under the weather. No, he played the third map. Like, what do you mean? So, I, Yeah, I, yeah. That, that was... That got me as well. Putting him in for the third map I is, mean, like, the biggest like, fuck, oh, fuck you. Oh, fuck, oh, fuck. Come on. <laughs> it's like, oh, shit, we need, to, we need to play him. Oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. You can play, right? You're still, like, not sick. You, you good? Yeah, you good? Wear a mask on stage? Yeah, you'll be fine? Like, come on, man. Oh, God. Yeah, yes. so, I, you know, I think it stems from sort of an idea that Prophet's performances on Brig, which was pretty good, by the way, in Jost, like, it, it just opened Pandora's box of, like, Prophet at maybe making the case that he sometimes should be put on flex support. And it's just not it, all right? Let, forget, erase from your memory that Prophet was pretty good on flex support in that meta and just move on. Just move on, guys. Like, just move on. Just move on. Like, this is just we. This on. cannot. This we cannot have this. All right. If you want to fuck around with this, like in your off time when it doesn't really matter, or like you want to try this out at the start of a new meta, like go ahead. Yeah, try it out for like a day of scrims and let be like, is this something we could pivot towards? Yeah, not in the middle of a playoffs. I don't know. It, I. <laughs> If someone comes out with a reasonable explanation and it's like, hey, I don't like what you guys did on Plat Chat, like you think, you know, there was more to this situation than you guys told, like, fair enough. But there's not a lot of excuses I could, like, put up with to defend this, this coaching decision. That was fucking weird and kind of awful. Uh, so, yeah. Overall, though, Toby, great year for him as a coach, but, you know, I don't know what yeah. went into this thing. So, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that was a pretty, pretty weird champ. Anyway. Um, all right. Someone genuinely in YouTube chat just put up the under the weather excuse and I am molding. I'm moving on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway. Anyway, next, moving on. Ne ne next up, next up. All right, we're done with the Soul Dynasty. Alonso Spitfire. Made top six. What, what, a, what a great little story here as well. You know? They, yeah. You know, we, we, we were on it early on in the, in, the, in, the, in the green rooms and we're chilling. I was like, what if London makes top three? What if they take down Houston and they make top three? What if, like, they fucking win that entire thing? Like, we got a bit ahead of ourselves. But overall, top six, great story. Th th this was enough for me to be like, oh, shit, this was awesome. Yeah, one of the biggest, like, stories, I think, from this year was London being rated so low by us and a lot of people. And then, wait, look at that. They come in. I talked to Christopher the first day we got there for rehearsals and stuff. I was like, you know, how are you doing? Like, what's up? And he's just like, look, we didn't really expect to be here. Um, and honestly, we're playing for fun. Let's go, baby. Like, we're, we're playing all right in scrims. I'm ready to rock and roll. And even Backbone in the interview said, look, we are playing for fun. Like, at the end of the day, um, we're in a situation a lot of people in the wider community didn't think uh, would happen. And looking at their opponents, obviously, you like Philadelphia Fusion. That, that was a very weird game, I'd say, to start off uh, playoffs. Everybody thought kind of Philly was going to do really well, especially with uh, how Zest and M3 have been kind of looking. 
They 3-0 them, and they go against Glads, and everybody thought Glads were going to be perfect for this meta, and then they beat Glads, and you're like, wait a second. Hang on. Maybe they go all the way. And honestly, even just getting top six is, I think, better than a lot of people expected. And man, uh, comparing the budget tier list and where they ended up versus a lot of other teams at the end of the year, insane shit from the backroom staff. Like, well-deserved co uh, coach of the year, of course. Um, but people like Nuki, too, who have helped form this roster, and Hardy, who has been, you know, uh, a positive force in the team, outside the team, also got an award, like the Dennis Avelka Award. Yeah. Like, god damn. Like, they garnered hella fans. And, like, I know the Chinese fan base also loves Hardy. Yeah. And yeah. loves London Spitfire. <laughs> and... Well, did you see the voting for the Dude. walls? Like, they're the reason yeah. Hardy, 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 Hardy. They're, they're, they're like, I think every single Chinese broadcaster voted for Hardy for Rollstar. Yeah, they did the know? Hardy like, cosplay too on broadcast. Yeah, like, they just love him, so. I think it's fucking sick. I think it's one of the funniest storylines we had this year was the London Spitfires come up. Like, man, I think it's, yeah, I, I'd be fine, hard-pressed to find a more, like, fun and engaging kind of storyline for this year than the London Spitfire making it this far into playoffs. Yeah. When was the last time he did that? What, when they fucking won? Like, yeah, Jesus it's Christ. It's the first time they've done it since they've switched their roster. You, yeah. you just got to give props. Like, I, as I said, I can't add too much to the conversation. We've talked the praises of London Spitfire throughout the entire year. The thing that was coolest for me is that one of the big things that they were missing throughout this year, they had a lot of success, they made it to all the tournaments, is that they never really had success in the tournaments uh in mid-season madness and summer showdown they fell short i am short of their own expectations but able to get top six when it all matters in the playoffs you, you got to give credit to them uh they did a great job like creating this roster i'm curious to see where it goes into next year um because i don't see them changing much of their roster going into next year but i think that they can fill it out quite well uh yeah. and hopefully they can get a little bit more a couple of extra pieces that will make them better contenders uh, going into next year and that hopefully they can keep the momentum running. I, well, I want to add a small point to that, like finding new bits and pieces. What's interesting and like looking at the overall ecosystem of Overwatch 2 now, it being free to play, if they're going to continue tending towards like European players and stuff, I wonder if there's any kind of superstars. Maybe it would take a little bit of time because the game to the public at least has not been out that long. Um, but I wonder if there's any superstars that have come in on the free-to-play side of things and not played Overwatch 1 that are suddenly, in Europe, I mean, are suddenly kind of really good. And I wonder if they're ever going to kind of peek their heads in because London's kind of the perfect team for that, for picking up European talent that might go a little bit unnoticed by a lot of other squads. Yeah. Shockwave? Shockwave? I don't know what Shockwave's up to. Good yeah. player? It's, it's good for Donald Spitfire because at least after uh, what a successful season, you know, team camaraderie, stuff like that. At least I feel comfortable with management, not hiring Glister and putting in a strategic coach and getting rid of the coaching staff. Like, I feel pretty comfortable in that they'll retain what they've actually accomplished and build on this and not go in a different direction and blow it up. So, you know, good for Donald Spitfire. <laughs> also, not just for them on a personal level, I think it was an important for a team to prove that you don't need budgeting because Florida Mayhem did the same thing in a way. Like, neither one of them, they weren't the lowest paid teams, but they weren't, they didn't have the same level of like money as some of these other teams. You can still put up good results with good coaching, good yep. management, and finding the right players, finding the roster that works for you, and putting it together. You can't just be like, oh, we don't have money. Let's just throw, right? Um, there's there's some teams like that, LA Valiant. So I just want I just want <laughs> teams to take a step back and like hopefully be able to put up uh, more competitive results because I'm sick and tired of having having bottom feeder teams that are just like, well, they're He's probably pissed. not going to win a match. I agreed, but also, <laughs> I've already heard, you know, we're not in silly season quite yet, but I've already heard some rumors that teams are looking at London and going, we want to do what London Spitfire did. And I'm just telling you, it's not as easy as it looks on paper, all right? Yeah. It's very, very hard. So I, I just hope that we don't get teams you know going like oh you know we'll just take some players and coach them up and then we're great <laughs> like it's not as easy as that um lono spitfire you know some I'm, I'm going to pull i'm going to pull a straw man here i'm going to pull a straw man here and i know it's in bad faith 
But some people, they were just like, oh, you know, London Spitfire, they excel at rush. A rush meta, like this kind of broad meta all season long, and then they kind of like locked into that in playoffs. No, the reason Lona Spitfire got far is because they were a great team. They had great yeah. communication, they had great teamwork. It was what they emphasized all season long their ability to work together and work as a team. And that was why they succeeded because they're a great overall team, synergy, teamwork, communication. And that's why they got far. So I, I, you know. There, there's no way you can undermine their achievement and how far they got in the playoffs. It's totally deserved. They're a great team with a great uh, structure. Primarily props to uh, Christopher, coach of the year, of course. Very much deserved. Like, th this is a team. This is a team more than anything. And their ability to succeed as a team gained them a top six slot. So it's an awesome, awesome um, achievement for them. Really, really cool. Um, so yeah, there we go. Long Spitfire. Um, We'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about them in the offseason and, you know, what, they, what we think they should do and whatnot. I just want to celebrate their achievement so far. So, awesome for them. Do we want to move on? Yeah. yeah. Next on the board. <laughs> How disappointing was LA Gladiators <laughs> playoff run? Sheesh. That's, uh, uh, yeah. it's a, it's a Giga tough. disappointing. All right. So, Didn't want a match. Oh, wait, no, they beat Philly. Never mind. They won a match. They beat Philly. Yeah. <laughs> so, on, let's go. Um, actually, I actually, you know, had a chat with Yiska for a little while, and you know, we talked about you know the the playoffs matter, and, like how close it was to the playoffs, stuff like that. You know, love the guys on Tactical Crouch. I listened to that podcast. You guys should too. It's an awesome podcast. Um, but just like you know, LA Gladiators, and I mean, this is not something strictly to our conversation, but something we talked about throughout the years that like LA Gladiators, like when they've had some time to adjust to a meta. Um, like they're actually like really good. Like Jotes, for example, like they figured out Jotes meta and like they were fantastic at Jotes like four weeks in. They just needed their time to like yes. find their identity and like find their roster and like what made them good in that meta. So I guess the case could be that like when this meta shifted towards Reaper, the Gladiators kind of got shafted, obviously playing with Happy on the Sojourn and Kevster on the Tracer. That was what they wanted to do. Then the meta moved away from that and they were another team who kind of like suffered because of that Reaper pick, right? So kind of sucks to see Gladius go out this early and maybe some of that had to do with the closeness of the patch and you know not being able to figure out the meta overall a bit disappointing still though yeah people thought they were going to be one of the better teams because they have people like Shu who can play you would imagine play Kiriko to like an unbelievable level um but wow yeah unbelievably disappointing um I think everybody had Glad's high up on their expectations list. Again, I want to see what we did for the bracket. I'm going to be honest. I will obviously get to that in a minute, but Jesus Christ. Is there, is it a case of not, not having enough time? Is it like a jokes thing? That was like the broadcast thing was like, well, they were good at the very end of jokes, right? So is that going to be the same here, but you don't have enough time? I don't know. I don't know what everybody else's thoughts are on it because I don't really have that many. I just think it was very disappointing. I hate the narrative of like, oh, they're just a team that takes a while to get going. All you right. know, in the let minute. me hear it. I'm totally I all fucking, ears. I sure. fucking Go. hate that. I think that is not how teams work and that kind of stuff. We praise the Los Angeles Gladiators coaching staff. That is not a that is not a thing that you can just say. Oh, you know, we just take a little bit longer to work our stuff out. No, you know, maybe we don't put Kevster on Sojourn. You know, maybe that would have helped you with your time and stuff like that. Obviously, something broke down in the Los Angeles Gladiator scrims that resulted in them being like, Kevster on Sojin, happy on Reaper. Don't know what the answer is of Kevster couldn't play Reaper, happy's more comfortable on Sojin, Kevster can carry more on Sojin. I don't know what the answer is. I because it doesn't really make sense to me. But I don't buy into this. They just slow to understand the meta. That just means that they want to copy someone else and then just get better at than everyone else. I think that they made some mistakes fundamentally coming into this playoffs with the, with the DPS lineup. I think Shu didn't perform at the same level with his Kiriko as we had expectations. Like he didn't look comfortable. His numbers backed that up as well. Like he wasn't really offering that as much as he would on other heroes. Um, and I think Reiner is a very good dive Winston when he is coordinating dives with his tracer and all that kind of stuff. But that's not what this meta is. This is a, you jump in and live for as long as you can Winston meta where it's like just being as big of a threat. And I think he struggled to do that as well. 
Uh, so, you know, it's disappointing for the Gladiators. They had a great season. They are a great team. They have great players, but there is a massive hole there that happened in playoffs. And, you know, you need to look at the team as a whole to why did they fa- fail in the Jotes meta? Why did they not perform well in the playoffs? If it is this idea of they are too slow to recognize their own strengths in a new meta, that is something that they need to work out. Is it a coaching issue? Is it a player issue? Is it a depth of your roster issue? There needs to be something fixed and you can't just use it as an excuse of, oh, they didn't have enough time to practice because they are a great team. They have great players. That is something that should not exist. And they have a good coaching staff. You know, we pray, I praise face. I praise Hunter. They're very good. Smash as well. They are great coaches. And I don't believe that they should be having these type of issues. All right. That, that, okay. Co- completely understandable. Com- completely get that. And you know, there are going to be teams and players who listen to this podcast sometimes, uh, I guess, more than we actually think about. And like the the answer to you guys who are actually like behind the scenes working on this stuff, we, we never, we, we don't have the full story. All right. And we, because we, we'll never know the events and like, you know, that you don't want to say that either in public. So it's not, it's not going to help. But so the way I view that, what you just mentioned as well is we almost, I'd say we were pretty nice to the Soul Dynasty for their underperformance, for being underwhelming. You know, they had a misread on the meta when it comes to the Roadhog. You know, if the Alley Gladiators, and I don't know this for a fact, I'm guessing here, say they were really good when it came to the Sojourn and the Tracer meta, for example, with Kevster on the Tracer, and that's what they played, and they did really good on that. That is fundamentally going to be a different playstyle from playing with the Reaper composition. And so if it really was the case that Gladiators excelled, Again, guessing, speculating on this Tracer composition, and then kind of close to the playoffs, teams like the Dallas Fuel started playing Reaper, and Gladiators were slow to adapt because they were like, ah, oh, we, we're so good on this Tracer thing that we don't really want to step away from the Tracer. We don't really want to pick up the Reaper because we acknowledge how strong we are in this Tracer thing. And maybe they had to like give up like pretty close to the playoffs, and they were like, fuck, you know, this meta got away from us. We didn't want this Reaper to be meta, and now we're here. We've had limited practice time with Kevster on the Reaper, and now like we're gonna shift around the roles. We don't really know what to do. And so, like, I, I, if we give Soul Dynasty almost like a pass in that, like, they had a misread on the meta, I also don't think we can be like, oh, the Gladiators, like, they, they like we should be hard on them in that regard like i so i i kind of want to almost give them a bit of a pass like they they had some issues in this meta and yes they had similar issues with the jotes meta but i can't say that i feel good just like just like criticizing them and their coaching mistake in that regard so uh, okay let me let me let me back up then okay i'm not backing down from my gladiators point i'm backing down if it felt like i was being nice to soul dynasty they are a hundred percent in the same disappointed bucket that uh, that i'm in right now for these teams of you know i'm angry because i care you know it's okay. like they are great teams and they have great rosters and that kind of stuff and my point is these teams have always struggled in the playoffs in those kind of situations and they haven't made that so it's like for me it's like i expect better of these teams and these players so it's like i hope that they can solve this and fix this because it's very disappointing seeing these great rosters and these great players fall so short um obviously everyone can't make top three and there's going to be some teams to succeed and uh, and fall um and i you know i'm not Mad. like i don't care and in the fundamental of like you guys are the worst blah blah and like that kind of stuff it's just i hope that we can see improvements going into next season so that these type of things don't happen for these teams because it's disappointing to see a gladiators fall you mean was the meta Top changes eight? um the playoff patch or do you mean changes in what way changes that just like solidify their roster right like so oh, the okay. los angeles gladiators they had a massive hole in their dps obviously they lost arns they lost patty that is like something that you can use as an excuse but it's like at the end of the day they had a hole in their dps roster soul dynasty there's a lack of confidence in their flex support player obviously they traded the mid-season so there are reasons of why these things have happened but when you are the gladiators who is investing as much as money as you are if you're the soul dynasty you have built this championship roster you have smurf and profit you really need to make sure that you're shoring up all these holes so that when you get to the playoffs even in extreme circumstances with very limited practice you can perform at a high level yeah it was it was 
kind of ironic, I, I suppose, that like when we thought about teams filling out their rosters and being prepared for anything, some teams just struggled to pick up the Reaper in that regard and prepare for a Reaper meta. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was a bit of a brawl comp. Um, I know Spilo has done some great breakdowns of how the meta actually works. Um, where it's like, oh, you know, you want to trade with the Winston Bubbles, the Reaper, stuff like that, you know, do, do good trades, stuff like that. Like, that is a different, like, tactical mindset from just, like, diving with Tracer or diving with Sojourn and, like, getting, you know, getting picks in that kind of way. And so I guess it was kind of ironic to see some teams struggle to kind of, like, do efficient trades in a Reaper, Winston Bubble kind of meta like that. Um, another, another point, though, like... Fuck! I I am really pandering to the teams here, Costa. So I apologize. You yeah, know? well, you, we need an apologist. We're playing good cop, bad cop right now, we, Johnny. You're up. We are. I, I, yeah, but also like you know, I mentioned earlier that Reaper doesn't have as much skill expression as a Sojourn, for example. Like the Sojourn, like when you look at the top teams who made it, it was Merit, it was Proper, it was Edison from the Dallas Fuel, it was Shy from the Hangzhou Spark. So the great teams they had arguably, like, the best Sojourns. Like, you can't argue with the fact that Sojourn was the most impactful hero throughout this mm -hmm. entire playoffs. So, if I'm the Soul Dynasty, and I go, hey, as much as we love Fitz, you know, and he's great, Prophet is the best player we have, and he's the most clutch. And as if we're the Gladiators, as much as we love Happy, and this, again, I'm not saying they should have done this, but if you are a coach, and you go, our best player is Kevster overall. We don't know if he's the best Sojourn because Happy is an insane Sojourn. But there is... I could kind of see the teams being like, let's put our best player on the most impactful hero. Now, in the Gladiators instance, fantastic Sojourn player. You have Happy, all right? You don't need to push your limits in that regard. But also, if Kevster is kind of struggling, if Kevster is kind of struggling on the Reaper and can't really you know, find his way when it comes to those There's ways to no trace stuff like that. no way you're telling me that Kevster doesn't know how to play Reaper, right? Like, Reaper is not a fundamentally mechanically different... I don't know, I don't he's know. we're a, speculating. He's so smart. Like, he's, like, I don't know. Like, surely he can be coached in five days of how to play Reaper in this meta. Yeah, right? maybe. Like, maybe we're speculating. I'm just saying, like, I could totally have seen from a coach's va vantage point being like, Maybe let's put Happy on the Reaper and let's put Kevster on the Sojourn because that is like what our peak performance would look like. And then we have Kevster, you know, a top three MVP candidate on the most impactful hero. And we have Happy, still probably a really good Reaper in that regard. Like I could see how teams thought that was the move. In retrospect, obviously the bad move, obviously what they shouldn't have done. But it's one of those excuses that I kind of like give teams when I'm playing good Swedish cop here on the show. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm making excuses because obviously coaching is very difficult. This stuff they're doing, it's very difficult stuff. And so I kind of, I'm a bit more lenient in that regard, I suppose. I, I, I think the thing that I want to bring up is that I think the thing that I am just the most disappointed in with both of these teams is that they had a plan and then they lost one series and just immediately abandoned ship which shows me that they didn't have trust in their own decisions that they made going into the playoffs like the gladiators with the kevster um happy thing where in that remember in their first series against london they were switching from map to map of like who's yeah. gonna play reaper and sojourn they were going back that, and yeah forth. that was that's like i i can't i i personally just cannot understand a situation in which switching a reaper and sojourn consistently from map to map ever makes sense in a meta which is like looking like it's going to be the most dominant one so like that i guess that's where my the biggest of my frustration and for the soul dynasty you know just to keep it you know equal it's the same thing with profit just automatically gut checking losing a series to dallas fueled the best team in the in the tournament and just being like oh shit put profit on kiriko and then they stop they reverse that in map three All right i just i think that's my frustration is they didn't go down just being a worse team in the meta, it feels like a bad decision was made. And I guess that's sort of what I, I have higher expectations for the coaching staffs and the teams. Okay. So the fact that we had so many teams doing these kind of last, last minute changes, we had um, Soul Dynasty with the Kiriko change. We had Gladius with their damage players. We had Toronto Defiant with Hotbow and their damage players. We had Atlanta Rain where Nero tweeted out like, hey, I just got subbed in just like, you know, without much practice time under my belt whatsoever. Um, there was one more team I like to believe. Um, Fusion they subbed in Cest after one series because allegedly, like, they wanted 
they wanted one belt to just like I don't know watch or something. It was weird. No, he but, well he wasn't he wasn't healthy to play. Okay. He was pushing through it. But um, yeah, but time was still wrapped. Yeah, yeah but stage. that point being, it do you think that that was a symptom of the playoff patch being too close? Like I I feel like the yes. fact that we had so many of these teams I mean, probably, undecided yeah. in that regard and not having it figured out. That is a symptom of the competitive integrity issue with the playoff patch dropping so close to the playoffs. But let, okay, then let's talk about the San Francisco Shock. Like this is that's a team. Like obviously you can talk about the Mike Clue stuff. Like that wasn't really as sure. big of a deal, I don't think. But they didn't lose their first series to the Houston Outlaws and be like, oh shit, maybe we should put Kilo on Sojin and Proper on Reaper, right? Like they just were like, well, this is what we practiced. This is what, like, they even stuck to the game plan. After you losing to the Houston Outlaws, Mikey having a bad map one on that first series against the Houston Outlaws, even in the lower bracket against the Shanghai Dragons, they put Mikey in again. They did what they had practiced. They stuck with that. And that is how their round began. Instead of panicking and being like, oh, shoot, we just lost the Outlaws. There's no way we're going to win the entire playoffs if we just don't change anything. They stuck with it. And then they had this miraculous run. Is there a world in which just... By sticking with one thing that you are going to get more experience, you're going to get more scrim time, and you will improve. Because almost never is making a knee-jerk reaction swap with like one day's practice to something else going to work for you. Like name a single situation in which that has happened. Like I can't think of many in the playoffs where a team has just made this weird one swap and everything has clicked for them. You Donald definitely Smith in 2018, but that kind of makes me put them all. So I'm not going to bring that up because you know they made some support changes. Uh, yeah, Vancouver yeah. Okay. Titans, they sub, they got rid of bumper and they picked up that Contreras guy TC or whatever. Yeah, but they TC, they but... ended up losing to the San Francisco Shock ah, and true. like that team was great. Like both of those situations is that those teams were just way better. They're, than they're dumb examples, else. so I apologize. Yeah, yeah. They're not really what you're what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, they're not but... really what I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. So uh, sorry for that. I'm this that's uh, that's disingenuous debating or whatever. What what will you? Have, definitely so. value consistency in kind of a playoff scenario. And like props to Shock for like sticking to that game plan. I I really don't like ripping off the bat and just like, wait, really? oh, fuck, change shit around. Like, oh, my God, just stick to what you know and stick to what you've kind of practiced and then kind of soldier on because you're going to get better throughout the series anyway as well, um, having more time in. Um, so, yeah, I've never been a fan of, like, knee-jerk reaction changes like that. Um, and especially when tensions are pretty high anyway and when you're playing, well, I guess... Top six, so it's a little bit different. But even when it is on a stage like that, your your nerves are still going crazy. You're not at home anymore. You're not in an online event. You're in an offline event. Changing shit up like that last minute is going to throw everybody through a, a slight loop because everybody plays the game a little bit differently. Like your one Kiriko is going to play differently from another Kiriko. So like or like literally any fucking role, any hero. So knee jerk reaction stuff like that, I do not think it's the place and time, especially when you're in. Um, in a playoff scenario maybe my read on that is completely wrong and maybe that's it works out some of the time but personally i value consistency over anything else like yeah. consistent roster in yeah to play I, this matter i i do want to backpedal myself just a little bit just to give some uh give me some buffer is something that i don't think obviously we can't talk about no one really knows is that a big thing that could result in any of these factors of the things we've talked about is there is a lot of things that happen internally in teams that we are not aware of. So obviously we don't know what happened with these teams, why these decisions were made and all that kind of stuff. We can only look at it from an analytical perspective of like what is happening in the server. So we don't, we don't really know what's happened there. There might be more, way more answers there than anything we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but from the surface yeah. level, that is my take. Yeah. I, I, from from where I stand, I'm kind of just like, I recognize that the playoff patch, when it hit, it's not the most competitive integrity viable kind of like approach yeah. to the game. And I'm willing to give some of these teams the benefit of the doubt. That being said, you are completely correct in your observation that like, <laughs> you, you in fact did not have to throw the kitchen sink because you could have done fine yeah. without your last ditch effort kind of sub and, and change stuff like that. So I do agree with you. But, you know, uh, yes. Um... Maybe some of these teams, again, just speculating, maybe they were like, you know, if we're going to win the entire thing, we need to make a drastic shift, and they did, but, you know, whatever. Let's move on. I think we cannot, we can't, I think we cannot beat the topic. Actually, they're like ladders before we move on. I think, like you said, I think it was you said it, Scott, like, 
I, I think almost like damage issues aside with the Kevster and the Happy thing, the big, the big question was like, Chu was not as good on Kiriko as we thought he'd be. You know, we came in thinking that Chu would be the best Kiriko in the game. And the fact of the matter was like, was not as big of an impact player that we, that we guessed. And then also like Reiner, like Reiner's Winston was just not as good as we thought it'd be. Um, and honestly, like, I think if anything, moving into next year, Reiner is someone who's actually like going to have to almost like prove himself again now, because I think that Reiner, he's he deservingly won the Roll Star Award and he's a Roll Star in our league. But also, then you have like moments like this where the Winston wasn't totally great. Um, we did some of those side content pieces earlier in the year where it was like, uh, Reiner doesn't really listen to the coaching staff. And then you're like, maybe you, you know, heard something through Gabe Fun. It's like, is this really the case? Like, that's not great. So we'll see what happens with Reiner. But I actually think that he has something to prove going into 2023 as well, because I'm not. I'm not entirely sold that despite being a role star this year, that he is this amazing, versatile tank that can like play any meta as much as we sometimes give him credit for it. That's just my opinion. But I think I think Reiner is an interesting character to follow in that regard. Like will he uh, will he be able to like become an amazing Winston, Reinhardt, and Doomfist still and like Junker Queen? Like he struggled with Junker Queen early on as well. Like I think I think Reiner is yeah. one of the most interesting tanks in that regard. Because there does seem to be something about him and his place in the LA Gladiators compared to some of the other tanks around the league that we view very, it was very reliable, you know, in that regard. I don't know at some point if Reiner showed that reliability, so. I think it's, he's, he's one of the biggest examples I've seen of this year of a player's confidence, I feel like, determining the, his play in the server. Like, it feels like in the first half of the year, he... he he had no respect for anyone. He just came in. He was just swinging it around, and he was he was pulling it off. But ever since that stage three, he just feels like he's never been the same player. So I hope next year we can see him come back and put up the level of performances we saw in the yeah. first half. And he did post that. Someone in chat reminded me. He did post that statement secondhand via someone else, where it was like oh, yeah. he did struggle this season, you know, with some mental and physical issues. I don't think it really went into that and what that was. Um, and I will also say to his benefit. Um, I believe it was in stage four when Gladius had that close series against the New York Excelsior and Yaki just like went crazy. I think Reiner played like some Soria then. I think he played like some Diva in that series. And what I heard as well was that Space was actually, I think Space said this in an interview actually with us, that he was actually the, the primary like off tank player for the team in that stage. But yeah. then Space fell sick. And so Reiner had to step in the last minute and play those heroes. So in that regard, I you know I can't look at those games where he played Star and Diva and be like in good faith, be like, oh, he was not good on these heroes. That was him having to like patch that up for the Gladiators while Space got sick in the middle of stage four, right? So, um, you know, that's not his fault. That's not his fault that he came in with zero practice and had to play those heroes for his team. So um I'm also willing those to give things. Reiner some benefit of the doubt, right? But yeah. Yeah. And those are those things, those internal things that I was talking about of like, there are a lot of things that happen that we just aren't aware of that are things that are happen internally that we can't quantify. Yeah. So, but, uh, goes for everything, by the way. Yeah. Goes for everything. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless absolutely. of where you are, like every single team, every single like player or like whatever, you don't know anything really. It's only the, the surface stuff at the end of the day, you know, gets put out on Twitter and, and whatnot. But if a player ends up getting subbed out and you're like, why? That makes no sense. They don't make a statement about it or, you know, maybe they do or they get dropped or whatever. Like, there's always a million things behind the scenes that, like, contribute to that reason. Um, yeah. Yeah. And some of it will never be public. And that is also fine, too. You also don't need to go digging or harass people to find out why X player is not playing or whatever no. the fuck, right? Um, yeah. that but happens with the you, entirety of the league too is like a product so. you're, you're entirely right there's always a story to the headline and yeah. uh, I, fe I feel is. like you know there's not argue actually Johnny I'd say there's more than one story to, to a headline there's always multiple things that go into a decision um, and normally the one story comes out but there's also a few other things that kind of lead up to that decision as well like yeah, we're, we're never always going to know the exact reason for a decision yeah. being made. No, I think you're right. Been a but, player, there's a lot of shit that never comes out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is. But also, yeah. I, I'll com I'll completely, you know, like put myself on the line in that regard. I think meeting up with all the players and teams and 
you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I can't speak for you, but I'm sure you guys agree as well. Like this playoffs and meeting everyone in person, like it was a big refresher that like, you know, there is a lot of shit that goes on behind the scenes that lead up to these moments. Yep. And sometimes as, you know, now the, I guess the head producer and talent of the Plat Chat Overwatch podcast and being like the sole founding member who's still doing this shit. Like I have a lot of responsibility to like tell the, to tell the right story and know the details. And sometimes, you know, even us, like the storytellers and analysts of the broadcast, like we don't even know the full grasp of things going on and I need to do better in that regard going into next year. Right. So I think that kind of goes for everything and everyone. Like you have to understand that there's more that goes into this stuff than just the headline. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. And for on that note, me and Johnny actually in a drunken stupor of the, the night of, uh, I am so nervous where you're going with the this. Grand, of the <laughs> night of the grand finals. You know, we, we did talk about like, you know, we were talking to some uh, management and some players and we sort of like, we agreed that next year we want to do a better job of talking to players and teams and getting their perspective on a lot of things so that we can portray it in a more accurate way. So if you are a player or a team owner or anyone who knows, who, who hears us say things and you would like to provide more context, you would like to do anything, just reach out to us. We're, we're nice and friendly. We'd love to be able to tell the story in a more accurate way. Yeah. So. Yeah. Because the, there was a surprising number of people who said that they watch Plat Chat. Apparently, the yeah. Hongzhou Spark players watch. Yeah, Plat yeah Chat. the <laughs> Spark <laughs> players watch Plat I'm Chat. Sorry, also, Changun. <laughs> shout out Spark. <laughs> shout out. out. Yeah, they, we actually yeah. got told that they watch Plat Chat with Chinese auto translating subtitles. I Legendary moment, Overwatch moment. Where, like Plat Chat is like a breached that side of the league too, yeah. where some of the Chinese players are <laughs> watching, which is it was amazing. Hilarious. Cause they, Love it. They, they said that. I was like, oh, they, Hangzhou Spark. I, I, I don't think the entire team like fucking sits in a cinema room with the top side of the, But like, <laughs> I guess maybe one or two of the players, like they pull up Plat Chat and they're like, I wonder what like the English audience is talking about us and whatever. And so they what they watch Plat Chat with like uh, the Chinese translating I, I, subtitles, I suppose. And then the second second point, they said, why? I don't understand. Why do people hate Shangun? <laughs> that was the <laughs> second question. <laughs> we love you, Shangun. You're great. You're awesome props for making top four again by the way i mean i'm just gonna i'm just legends what an absolute legend of the sport yeah look at, look at this resume right here he, top four first wait what what happened it hasn't updated it hasn't updated Why not? he's, they, he's yeah. adding top four at another playoffs to his resume Chang let's go baby what a legend let's of go. the sport there you go so uh yeah, they didn't understand why we didn't like Changun. We love Changun. I don't know what you guys are talking about. It's kind of a meme at this point. It's, it's kind of a yeah. meme. Anyway, love it. So yeah, shout out, shout out to the Hangzhou Spark. Thank you for watching. Good stuff. Um, they also, they also thought it was fucking funny when we talked about Hangzhou Spark, and they have a team manager called Gandalf as well. <laughs> they, they were like, well, "Why is that so funny?" I just love the Hangzhou Spark. I love them yeah. so much now. They're the best. So yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, Shout out to the actual spark. But yes, uh, that's, that's sort of like ties a knot on that as well. Um, so there you go. We kind of got into the end here of teams to talk about. Um, next up, we got uh, the Florida May Mayhem. You know, the exit towards the, uh, the loss to the Hangzhou Spark. As I said, I casted that game. Very fun game to cast, by the way. Very fun series to cast. That was a banger of a match. Uh, arguably better than Dallas Fuel versus Soul Dynasty that you guys did. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. We were so excited for Dallas yeah. Fuel Soul Dynasty, and that I match was, sucked. I was yeah. about to pop off, bro. I was like, we were like, oh my god! Like literally, some of the first lines me and Scott talked about on the cast was. Yeah, you know, like this is grand finals preview that lo a lot of people are kind of hoping for. This is going to be a sick one. And then Dallas Fuel just kind of dick, double dick down the Soul Dynasty. I'm like, no, yeah. please, let's go back five. <laughs> like, it's brutal. Oh, man. Brutal. Yeah, so me and Rose, we casted the Florida versus Hank Joe Spark, the bubblegum matchup. Amazing match. Bubblegum. I mean, Shy just went absolutely crazy. Um, <sighs> nothing stops that man. Nothing. Nothing does it. Um, I mean, wow. So yeah, talking about the Florida mayhem, though. As I said, I rewatched. I rewatched this entire series actually, because first of all, I was curious about my own casting and how I did. But second of all, Florida mayhem should have totally won that push map. They had like four ults. They had 105 meters. They had the high ground. Yeah. And then in the same fight towards the end with one minute left, checkmates gets absolutely railed while death blossoming for like one second. 
Hydron utilizes the overclock. I think they throw like a Kitsune rush or something too, when they didn't have to at all. And just threw away all their ultimates. <laughs> and Hydro Spark ended up capping the point, winning a fight, continuing, and then winning. They win three fights in a row. Like winning three fights in a row and push, it shouldn't happen. So Florida Man. It's AM, ridiculous. Yeah. They, they should have taken that to map five. And, you know, Hydron, I think it could make the case that Hydron, despite being really hyped up, um, Despite, you know, he was really hyped up going into it. Like, he tweeted this out as well. I don't think he played as well in the playoffs as he would have liked to. I don't think he was a difference maker that we expected him to be. He has some good moments. But this matchup was all about Shy, And I think the Florida fell a bit flat because of that. Yeah, I, I think this was, like, a disappointing end for Florida Mayhem. Because as you said, it didn't feel like they played as themselves. Especially in that final fight. Like, as you said, that was just pure panic. And, like, I'm sure if you talk to the players and the coaches, you say what happened on that map, they would say they were so close and they panicked and they were just like, oh, we just need to win one fight. I can win it. Everyone pops their ultimates. Everyone just overcommits. So, you know, I feel for the players. We've all had those moments um, in our careers. So disappointing. But I think as a whole, it, it's been an incredibly successful season for the Florida Mayhem and they should be proud of what they've accomplished. Uh, they had a hodgepodge roster that no one really believed in, but they've brought up a lot of rookies that will be in our league for a while. As Johnny said, Hydron in the playoffs wasn't very impressive, but he had a banger of a year. Like he is a oh, player yeah. you should keep your eye on. Uh, someone as well, Chad Mate Redemption Arc. Animo is apparently still, he had a crazy redemption. Like I know a lot of people were surprised he got re-signed, um, but he's playing well, especially on that Lucio. Uh, and then Sir Marjad and RuPaul, uh, Mechanical Gods. So there's a lot of great pieces of this Florida Mayhem team. I'm curious to see what's going to happen with them. I saw uh, Goomba made a tweet today saying that he's in renegotiations for Florida Mayhem, but he's open to offers. So uh, what this Florida Mayhem team will look like next year will be, uh, will be curious because I wouldn't be surprised if a bunch of these players get poached by better teams. And I then think Goomba yeah. has to rebuild. Yeah, that, which to be fair is one of the big strengths of Florida and like Goomba is the ability to rebuild yeah. a roster. So I'm pretty excited for Florida Mayhem. Hydron, I think, is definitely going to get poached. Like, that yeah. guy is good. And he's not reached his ceiling yet either. There's just no way. And like you said, the back line's very mechanically gifted and you're just kind of drilling drilling into them, I guess. More like non-mechanics, non-like ape play. Like, oh, you know, I'm going to front line a Zen or like, you know, just going a little bit crazy. But then it's funny because Kiriko's that hero where Sir Majed, who has like, very good mechanical skill, but sometimes positioning wise, like not that great. And you can see where how much his mechanical skill like impacts the way he plays because he wants to play super aggro, he wants to play kind of up in your face, and like because he knows he can win out these 1v1s, these you know, ridiculous fights that you shouldn't be able to win. But like Kiriko is like the perfect hero for him in that way because you can just swift step away from out of danger, out of a bad position. So yeah, I'm super excited uh, for Florida Mayhem. But yeah, I think Hydron's going to be the hottest commodity. Him and someone will be the hottest commodities on that team, like for sure. It'd be interesting if Florida's open to trades or if they want to retain their place. Yes. Because there I are would, teams honestly, that have been... You know, I'd love to see the team carry place. on. Just it, if this team stayed the way it is, I'd love to see them uh, develop the team more and like yeah. where they will end up next year. I, I think it has mad potential. That'd be the ideal for me. Anyway. If I'm if I'm Albert Ye, which I'm not, because I don't have a three point shot, I <laughs> think I I I think I think you're almost looking at a bit of a Paris Eternal in 2020 scenario, where you, where like you might have potential buyers of some of these players. Whereas in 2020, you know, Paris Eternal, they had what Hanbin, Sparkle, did they? They had that entire XE. gang Fielder, Xe. They, they, they had them all. No, did I? I can't remember. Uh, that. No. Uh, no, don't hold the doesn't doors matter. on Dallas, I think. It doesn't matter. Chat's got them all, but it doesn't matter. The point being that, you know, Perseter obviously sold off their players to Dallas Fuel, and you got the Element Mystic, you know, thing with Rush as well. If I'm Albert Ye, which again, I'm not, because I don't have a three-point shot, I do think that, like, Florida Mayhem could be, like, is there really that much more to the roster as is? I think you kind of sell high on some of these players. I think... I agree. I think you kind of go like someone is a future role star and there are teams maybe like Shanghai Dragons that want to retain 
their top tier status in the APAC region, backed by Netties, probably have fucking bags of money, you know? And they'd be interested in picking up someone who's one of the best tank prospects in the entire league going into next year. Um, Checkmate has looked good, like really good throughout points of this season, like the Tracer, the Reaper. Again, I've praised numerous times um, Checkmate's like intellect as a player. Like, I think he has really good game IQ. I think he understands how the game is played and he executes in a good manner. But like, is that really going to lead to competing for stage titles and stuff like that? Not, not sure. Like, yeah, how would much you checkmate spend a buy out on checkmate, right? Like, is it worth buying out checkmate? I don't know if there's a lot of. I feel that's the same way about Animo. I feel like they've had a great season, um, but I don't know if people are going to be actively trying to buy Animo and checkmate. But I think the big commodities are so much Ed, RuPaul, someone, and Hydra. I think yeah. those are going to be the people that people are going to come knocking on the door, being like, "What? What's the price tag for these guys?" Yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure who would be interested in RuPaul. Like maybe if you had like Alston Alt, Alston. I think RuPaul. I, I would rather sign RuPaul than Samajed from this season. Uh, if I if I had to pick one of the two, I think RuPaul has been consistent. I think they're both incredible, and I think they would be great to have no matter what you have. But I think RuPaul is a, a more known quantity in my idea, in my eyes of like. I think he's just been really good. Yeah. Like I re every time he's played. No, yeah, he looked great. I'm just saying, like, if you're wheeling and dealing, like gladiators are not needing a flex support. I think Houston Outlaws would be like the team who would be like, we're looking at you know flex support candidates for next year because I don't, you know, as good as as good as they were and like they got top three and everything. I don't think creative is their, you know, be it end all in that role. Yeah. I don't know what the Outlaws gonna do. Obviously, the whole Pelican scenario, like you mentioned earlier, I don't know what the direction is uh, with that team. But that could be like a potential buyer for RuPaul in that case. I think, you know, the point being, even with someone like Hydron, if I'm, if I'm a GM for the Florida Mayhem and I'm wheeling and dealing, I, they, I think you kind of sell high on this roster. I want to see this roster continue. Obviously, it's a great story going into next year. But I'm not going to let that potentially cloud my judgment of like seeing, you know, how valuable some of these players are now that you've developed no. them. Oh, I don't know. That's that's I, my that's my cold like business take. All right. Obviously. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. So I get it. Uh, with a lot of these teams that it's same with like the London Spitfire, right? I'd like to see them stick with the roster that they have. Again, I come from like a consistency is kind of king mindset and um, not chopping and changing around. They probably will end up uh, end up doing that. A lot of teams will, but I love seeing. Teams like Florida Mayhem, which are a hodgepodge team, um, kind of stick their guns and then move on to next year and see if they can do even better uh, than they've done this year. Um, yeah, but it's just me. Obviously, the ball per business side of things. Yeah, ideally, if you do want to sell Hydron, because he's very good, maybe you do want to sell someone, et cetera. So, yeah, we'll, we'll end up seeing, but my hope is that they don't end up doing any of that. Yeah, and just stick with the hodgepodge because I think that's another cool storyline. We don't normally see like a super hodgepodge team, and Florida Mayhem is that team right now, which is which is kind of cool. Yeah. I like it. I think I think the brutal fact is some t some people, obviously, especially fans of the franchise, they're like, why can't we build around someone in Hydron? I like take this to the next take this to the next level. But like the brutal fact is just like it's super hard to be like top tier competitive. Because, yeah, sure, you might have two fantastic pieces in someone in Hydron, but now you have yeah. to find three similarly good pieces, integrate them to your team, and make it work. It is much easier from a management standpoint to take this roster, maybe, like, flip some players, and you can go, like, hey, hey, you know, I can't remember the name of their owner, who, by the way, employed me at some point. But I can't, I can't remember. But it's much easier to just go, like, hey, we made X amount of money from the development of these talents. And like, we actually, you know, had some return on our investment in this regard. It's much easier to do that from a business standpoint than be like, yeah, let's, let's, it's so thrilling to compete for titles. So let's take this, invest even more money. And who knows? You need a million bucks to get good enough players to like, to fill out this roster to be competitive. And even then, like, you don't even know if it's competitive. So it's like, I don't know. I'd be surprised if Florida decided to flip that switch and be like, screw it, we're going competitive. I, I, as I said, I think it's much more likely that they'd be willing to trade their good. players and rebuild. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think we're aligned in that regard. So as much of a great story this is, obviously, we'll have to see what to do. Maybe they go, you know, for, you know, maybe they go run it back. I don't know. 
I don't know, there might be a few ads to this roster and like maybe they want it back next year. You know, sign me up. All for it. I'm just trying to share, you know, what I view as also the, the, the reasonable decision to make in their scenario as it is right now. So I'm trying to play, tell both stories, right? But if they run it back, awesome. I'm down. It's going to be thrilling, you know? I've already mentioned how much I love this roster several times, right? So we'll see what they do. But regardless, I don't think this roster can go wrong in what they're doing. Also, if they decide to go and, you know, get new talent next year, they've already proven. They have, like, the best scouting in the entire fucking league. So... Who knows what talent they found next year that can fill in this roster, right? And they have a gun ball. So I think they're sorted. I think they're good, you know? Um, yeah. It's a great time to be a Florida Mayhem fan. There you go. Um, and all right. Finally, though, for these final teams, you know, we're already going long. I didn't really have a, I didn't really have a specific team. You know, we have Philly, Shanghai, Atlanta, Toronto. Don't really think we need, like, individual segments for some of these teams. Obviously, there are story tied into all of them. We've already been over Shanghai Dragons at the start of the episode for the most part. And, you know, with Void signing off, logging off Overwatch, it seems like that roster is done for. Um, obviously, pretty disappointing to see Shanghai Dragons not being able to live up to this meta either. But maybe they were at some parts influenced by Soul 2. We'll never know. I have zero insight into Shanghai Dragons in that regard. And they played Shock, uh, you know, in, in one of their first matches there. So it's tough, right? But um, yeah, they played Shock and Hangzhou. That's fun. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's any team out of these four that stand out to you that you think is really interesting here, but yeah. Uh, I'll rapid fire through them. Philly was incredibly disappointing. I think by far and away the worst team in the playoffs. Uh, they just did not look comfortable at all uh, in bad. this meta. They look, they look bad. Uh, Shanghai Dragons, as you said, we didn't really see good coordination from them, but they also played against some really good teams. Uh, Lip Fox. I'm very curious to see what Shanghai does next year build around lip 100 percent. if you're the shanghai dragons because i expect to see them lose a couple of players uh it feels like that shanghai dragons dynasty of like 2020 2021 is well and truly over uh atlanta yeah. rain just not a good meta for them just like straight up uh not able to play hawk that effectively uh, speedily is like not able to play it's like not really a good meta for his hero pool that it feels like um so not great and toronto looked better when they put hopper in the lineup as i said they almost beat the spark so it would have been interesting to see how far they would have gone if they hadn't got the spark first round um in the lower bracket but this what it is yeah Charles, do you have any teams that stand out to you here well you know i just pointed my boys trying to define oh yeah what the fuck man can't believe all, so many roll stars was wasn't able to get through the first round jack that's my crazy. roll stars man <laughs> come on dude i expected them to do a little bit better but honestly looking at the teams that they lost to i'm like yeah okay <laughs> you know yeah. outlaws making it that far having an unbelievable run and then same with the spark also having an unbelievable run maybe if they played some other teams they would have gotten a little bit further but still a little bit disappointing. They did go to map five with Spark, though, to be fair. So. Yeah, that was a close series. But that was also the series that Spark decided to inexplicably put in Pineapple for four of the maps. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. And then put in Alpha Yi as number five. So I, 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 st I still don't understand that. It still has no context. Either. There is no reason. Honestly, look, Toronto, I feel like it, Toronto are a team that are probably going to ditch half their roster and then go again next year not sure yeah. it feels that way to me just on, around the back line yeah it's like you want to keep twilight ideally right i mean at the end of the day their back line's been one of the best oh, like can all right johnny actually no reset is there a world in which you trade chorong and twilight because the rumors are that Chorong is like getting a bag. Like he was yeah. the player who like the rookie who really got the big bag. Like, are you better off trying to see anyone who would want these players? Like a Houston Outlaws maybe want a, a, a Chorong or something like that. And then rebuild around other players. Okay. All right. <laughs> we heard some amazing juice and i can't say it on the show so i'm, I'm sorry i'm going to blue ball the audience right here uh, i'm sorry i just won't be able to so uh completely separate from the juice we got uh or not completely kind of uh tangentially related um so here's how i look at it i think despite the viewership in the playoffs and like how 
you know, some of these teams, they're probably like really looking like optimistically and they want to invest now and like get good rosters. I, I think, I don't even think we're at like 2019 levels when it comes to like investing in rosters. There are a few teams, um, you know, if you look at that DSK budget list, tier list, for example, that I think like really invest. Um, and, you know, Toronto Defiance, we're pretty high up on that list itself. I just don't see that the, the, despite how good like Chorong is as a rookie and like one of the best main sports, who the fuck would pick up that contract? Who would be yeah. willing to pay that amount of money for a main support? Like, I don't care like how good he is. It's just like budgeting. Like you yeah. can't afford yeah. to have that guy on your roster in such a, you know. That role's role not that, worth that amount of money. Yeah. And so if there was one case ever, we this happens in real sports, this happens in traditional sports, where one team, if this... I, I did not say anything about them rebuilding whatsoever. But if there's one case where like, hey, like maybe we want to like get rid of this player. Like would, would you, we could still pay some of his salary if you take on like a big part of his contract or something like that. No way Toronto is going to pay some of his salary and give him away. Yeah, that seems well, like a scam. And now, allegedly, this has been rumored since the start of the season that Shoron got the bag. You're stuck with an expensive contract for well, you a fucked up. player. Try and sell him. Like, you, they have to try and sell him. Like, yeah, they, what I'm saying I, is, I, who, like, if you are doing Borpa business stuff, being able to pay a buyout fee plus the contract. No, that's the fucking team is going to want him. No, Why are you no, saying this shit? Like, no other team is going to want to pay that contract. No, then no one's going to pick up that contract. I'm sorry. Did you say Shanghai Dragons? They have fucking yeah. Lee Jae Gone. Yeah, no. but you know, maybe, maybe Lee Jae Gone, maybe it's time for Joe to go to a different. Then maybe it's time to go to a different place, Lee Jae Gone. Like, go to a different team. If you're the Shanghai Dragons and you're fully rebuilding, like, maybe that makes sense. There's a couple of teams, like Houston Outlaws, maybe they're just going to have a big bag next year and they'll just be like, fuck it, Joe Ron, come here. But, like, I don't know, but I think you have to, try, like, my big problem with Toronto that back is I think this is a dumb line, take. This their is attack line part. and their DPS line are uh, they need to have more money in there. They need to buy some big players because right now they are not cutting the mustard. If 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 the management of Toronto Defiant they call me on my fucking phone right now and they say, hey, what like could we work out a trade for you to get Chorong? Uh, and you know like we could work out on a buyout. I'd say yo. There is no fucking way I'm b paying a buyout plus eating this contract from this guy. So the best I can do is I'll pay some of his salary and there's no buyout and we'll take him on and we'll offload this contract. Like that is how NBA, that's how NFL works, all right? I'm not paying a buyout fee plus a big contract from a main support player. There's just no shot. I'm not, I don't, I don't care if it's Shorong. I don't, sorry, it's just not worth it. That was, that, yeah, it's... Uh, uh, fucking three, Toronto three people, defied. Three fucking people Toronto have no defied, insight dude. into business and trading and budgets yeah. and whatsoever. We're just sat here speculating with... Well, no, you're oh, saying yeah. it's speculation, but it's not at all. If he is getting the bag, why would you do it? That's like actual just simple maths. It's simple mathematics. Like, how is that up for debate? The contract, if it is too fucking big, what fucking team is going to want to pick up that shit when they can pick up maybe another hot prospect at half the cost? You know what I mean? Maybe, you know, if Toronto are giving them the bag, maybe they fucked up a little bit. Maybe they fucked up a little bit. And you know what will happen? He might actually just straight up go back to contenders or something. No, if he's they not, don't no, want to no, stick no. with him There's, and no, extend no, the contract. No, 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 I don't no, think. No, because Toronto would I don't think you can happen. cut it for costs. Like, well, no, that, well, if it comes down to the contract that he's on, if he's on a one yes, plus one, sure. and they, but there's no way that they would just not pick up his contract because that would be literally putting him into free agency and you lose pretty much all your value. Maybe they do that. Maybe they're just like, hey, Chorong, no one wants you for what we have you for. We're just going to drop you and good luck. Like that would be great for a lot of teams, but I yeah. don't think, I think they're more likely to try and pick up the contract and try and offload it. If that, remember, this is all speculation that they would yeah, want to yes. offload it. This all comes from a place and I don't want this to get mixed up. Chorong is a phenomenal main support and he is one of the things. The question that we're having is that I don't think he is good for the Toronto Defiant for what he is providing because he's a main support. Main support is not as impactful as a role as some of these other things. That's like, I don't know, 
football terms, spending money on an unimportant, on a kicker, right? Spending all your money on a kicker when, and then you're just like, what? We don't have any budget for a quarterback, right? Did I do a good sports ball reference, yeah, Johnny? That's perfect. Yeah. That's it. But that's I, the I problem. Wouldn't, I wouldn't say Churong is a kicker, you know, but uh, yeah, let's, let's go on. Yeah. You know, he's something like that, you know, <laughs> one of the less important roles of the, of the football team. I don't know. The one that runs around a lot. Um, the defensive that, lineman. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah Churong, the defensive lineman. <laughs> Is not worth the money that he's on. Sports ball. He's an edge rusher, dude. He's really good at this job. No, I don't okay. want. Uh, actually, they're really impactful. Never mind. I we're doing a terrible job at this. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is one of the topics that I really don't feel comfortable like um yeah like speculating about because everyone sh everyone listening to this podcast should know we don't have insight in this regard and we have no experience yeah. running a, a team's budget and you know making trades stuff like that like fuck <laughs> dude i have thank fuck that i'm not in charge of making trades for a team i i never want to become a general manager i would fuck that up so hard i would like wake up one day look at my excel sheet and be like what if I just ruthlessly, cold-bloodedly sent this player away and like picked up some <laughs> random dude? Like I, that that would be I, not suited for me. That would be terrible. But yeah, they should build around the back line though. To uh, to go all the way back to the very top of this topic, build around the back line. I I think if they can't offload him, they need to build around the back line, and they yeah. need to find a way to pick up players. <laughs> Oh God. <laughs> just throw a bigger bag. Just get a bigger bag. Honestly, just fuck it. Full send. You know, you're in too deep. Full send, baby. Just buy more players. The first $15 million roster. Yeah. Let's go. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the who are the other teams in that DSK's budget tier list that they like spend money? Was it like Gladiators and it was it was it was it was remember. shock gladiators shanghai and toronto yeah. around the top i think those yeah. were the those were the big spenders oh so, and dallas so yeah and dallas yeah. shanghai they won a title last year you know they got they got they they paid for the title the fact that toronto lost out in the first round with hotbow and winston and like their damage <laughs> came up, what a massive disappointment they yeah. just just start fresh bros like it didn't it didn't work out so yeah i don't know what's gonna happen to chorong um it's a bad situation overall. I'll say this. Uh, fucking hell. Toronto Refined are so entertaining to talk about. Uh, KDG tweeted out this morning. Um, I'm looking for team posts. Um, and they should sign KDG. If they sign KDG. Can you amazing. imagine if they okay. drop new sign KDG? Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. Um, by the way, all the NFL fanboys are in the chat right now trying to figure out what Chorong is. And it's very entertaining <laughs> because they've gone from defensive lineman to kicker to tight end and it's like all over the place. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, KDG posted that looking for, looking for team thing. It was interesting to hear Christopher, when he won yeah. Coach of the Year in that interview, to credit KDG as like one of the primary inspirations for his coaching system and structure that went into how Christopher likes to coach. Um, I think it was interesting that KDG, when he left the Toronto Defiant, all the logic stuff aside and, you know, dealing with the Western players, I think it was in like 2020, stuff like that. All that aside, I think it was interesting when KDG left Toronto Defiant, uh, where he ended up getting fired or whatever it was, that the rumor was that the primary player that he had some issues with were Muse. I think Muse had some silly Twitter posts around that time as well, right? Yeah. There was some stuff going on there. I think it's interesting that... Toronto Defiant's kitchen sink panic mode thing in the lower <laughs> bracket is to have Hotba play Winston for them in the playoffs. Something that they already have a player, which is that is his primary role and that's what he's good for. I'm just saying, I don't think KDG is totally like at fault here for what went down with the Toronto Defiant earlier. There. This has been a fucking clusterfuck from the start this year for the Toronto Defiant. And I would not just blindly blame KDG for everything that went down. This is a team based on their player substitutions, their rotations, and Hotba playing fucking Winston in the playoffs when you have a Winston player. This is a team that is having some kind of issues when it comes to the chemistry. I, I wouldn't even blame Moby Dick. I think Moby Dick is like the interim head coach. Like, I'm fucking trying my best over here. There is more stuff going on here. And if I'm a team, I say... I think KDG probably is like, be, you know, people are being too harsh about his name. I think there's a bit of slander going on publicly because there's not all the details are not out in the open. I think KDG is still, to me, a good coach and he's not at fault for what went down with 
Throw the fight through this year. Rede Dude, if I could see any team under the hood of any team this year, like I, you could just get a sneak peek of everything that went down. Toronto is the team I would love to see. Of just like, how the fuck did we end up here? Like, how did from where they started to where they ended? How did we end up here? Because I think it would be a trip. It would be, a, be trip. a good time if we had that like inside Netflix documentary. Like, yeah. While it on. Uh, they're gonna be they're, okay in ten years. Netflix is gonna make a you know those documentaries of like looking back at the twenty twenty two. Oh yes, yes. Our oh, microcosm yeah. of a microcosm of a microcosm. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in, in many That's ways, true. when it comes to like actual documentation, it falls to us because we're the actual Overwatch you know specialists. We're the we're the experts when it comes to this matter. The historians, so the documentarians. We are historians. So you know when and when we feel like it's time to stop fucking styling on them and you know world star Toronto Defiant like. Maybe, you know, we should actually do some analytical like research and like dig into it as well. Some detective work because what a fucking roller coaster. I still think that if you are a lower end team with <clears throat> probably a full Korean roster, you should look into picking up KDG because I still think his track record is relatively fine. Yep. If I'm looking at some of the Toronto Defiant players on this team, I'm probably going, wait, what happened this year? Hmm. Let me think twice about, you know, before I just blindly pick up some of these players. Um, so interesting scenario for sure. Interesting. That being said, hot bus the fucking move goat. On hot bus a legend. To the fucking pick and bracket, True. Bro. Hot bus a legend. Yeah, sorry, we have to move on. Final Give thing. Give me a fucking pick and bracket. I want to see how uh, fucked up we do. All right, sh shut up. You want to move on. You want to go play with your fishes. All right, I get it. Uh, no, I want to see our fucking bracket. All right, chill out. One more thing. <laughs> okay. If I'm, if I'm, I, this is just an add-on to the prior conversation about Chorum. If I'm, if I'm like a superstar damage or tank player and uh, a main support comes in and gets like the b fucking bag of money i probably want a bag of money too so let's see how that plays out wherever are we about to get up. another 2019 inflation of all player salaries again uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying i think i think <laughs> the overwatch league equivalent to the rudy gobert trade with the timberwolves it's probably chorong's main support contract it's probably messed with the uh, the, the market a little bit here and what player thinks yeah, they're worth i and what I, they I, I genuinely think we're about to enter into another weird situation with overwatch 2 coming out and the success yeah i think i think if if you're a player and you're listening to this, ask for the bag. They'll probably throw it at you. <laughs> Fucking everyone's salary's going I, up. I don't think that's true, I but good luck to the players. No, just do it. This Go leads on to a topic later about the, the viewership spike and how popular the league all could right, potentially all right. be. Well, one, more thing, one more thing on that matter, you know, we've sometimes seen it repeatedly. You only get one chance in the Overwatch League, so don't just immediately throw yourself at the league minimum for a bad team, you know? You, can't, you know, think hard and long about your chances and your situation. Maybe ask for a second opinion from someone else who's knowledgeable. I don't know. One more thing. I didn't get to talk about the Atlanta Reign. Just quickly going to say, Atlanta Reign bombed out of the playoffs. I still think they have one of the most talented rosters for the next few years to True. come. That roster is fucking sick. That being said, rumors that there's some stuff going on behind the scenes. We'll see what happens with the Atlanta Reign. But uh, Atlanta Reign, yeah, sick roster still. So we'll see what happens with that org moving into 2023. Dude, silly season's going to be fucking sick, bro. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Anyway, gonna be wild, anyway yeah. yeah, move on. We're going to we're gonna head into our playing bracket. That was juicy. God, there's so much juice everywhere. It's just overflowing. We're, we're like fucking bathing over here. Uh, silly season can't come soon enough. Anyway, let's go. Playoff bracket. Uh, so, I mean, naturally, th this website is a bit... How was it? You know, it's so... I can't... Oh, it's I such can't a shit scroll website. It, it was straight up. It just like, there's it no cuts way to off. say it. I can't yeah, minimize it. This is the max view I get. We, so, next it year, looks we like are, shit. We it, fucked up kind of, royally. The aspect ratio is kind of yeah. So it cuts That's off fine. here. So you know this. this we had Philly beating moment. London in the first round. Uh, uh, no, we had London beating no, Philly. We had London. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, Shanghai was with three on Spark. That was wrong. We had Atlanta three on in Florida. That was wrong. Um, well, that Shanghai um, Hangzhou game boomed like ninety nine percent of press. Because it was a three zero yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> I just look over at chat, and someone in chat says, "So Chorong is leaving the Defiant? Is that confirmed? <laughs> is that confirmed? Yes. The podcast where we speculate for three hours on bullshit. It is confirmed. Yes. Wow, it's crazy. Uh, Don't take what we say serious. Come yeah. on now." Uh, Outlaws beating Toronto Defiant, of course. We had, in order of the things, we had Dallas selecting Lono Spitfire. That did not happen. We had Shock yeah. picking the Dragons. That lost. We had Gladiators picking Atlanta Rain. That lost. And Soul getting Houston Outlaws. Uh, but that was Shook, of course. They got them. So we still I mean, got that points shit is for so Soul hard to Dallas. guess. Yeah. Who's going to pick who? It's yeah. impossible. Yeah. You know, 
I, I want the bag if I correct this bracket per, uh, perfectly. We yeah. had Soul beating Dallas. Sorry, that's Smurfheads. I take full blame for yeah, Soul Smurf beating heads, Dallas. Yeah, this we is your fault. Yeah. Out of control here. Dallas Fuel fans, you have complete and utter um, um, the permission to shit on us for this, or shit on me and Avas primarily. Um, we had Shanghai beating Atlanta Rain. Shanghai, a massive disappointment. We had Atlanta course. beating Gladiators. No how comments. did that happen? No comments. No comments. How did that happen? Wait, wait. How, yeah. How no, did wait, that happen? This is happen? my bracket. This is not the Plat Chat bracket. Oh, this is oh, my bracket. I was going to say, Johnny's what the fuck? Goop. Oh, God. Johnny's off the group. Go to the Plat Chat one. What the hell? This is my bracket. I just went, uh, dude, I just kind of like, you know, hip fired it a little bit in my bracket afterwards. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. I was like, there's no way I would have allowed us to put the Atlanta rain over the glass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so here's the thing. I think I forgot to save our bracket. So I'm going to pull up. Like Governor Newsom says. That's an ad. Sorry, guys, on YouTube. Yep. Uh, this is an ad about uh, California's uh, voting going on right now. Go vote. Voting is yeah, important. Yeah, go vote. Hell yeah. Democracy. What an invention. Thank you. Love Romans democracy. Or came up with that. I can't remember. Democracy. Uh, hell yeah, democracy. So I'm just going to pull up this, okay? <laughs> This is us on doing the bracket. So I think this is in stone. We got we had Houston be, beating London. Wait, what? Where are we? Oh, this is elimination round. Fuck! This is so suboptimal. I am deeply sorry. Um, where are we? All right, we're just fast forward here. We had Shanghai. This is elimination round again. Fuck! Where's our upper bracket? Go further back. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, there you go. Wait, no, you had it. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, there you go. Oh, wait, no, oh, oh, hey, oh, oh, uh, close, almost, there. This is elimination. Oh, that's elimination. Go further back. I'm so sorry, guys. This is scuffed. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, here we go. All right. Three, we two, Philly. Philly beating I thought we had Philly. Hey, I was going to say, go. I okay. we had Philly Wow, really? London. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that was terrible. We had Shanghai. Three, two, though. We gave Hangzhou two maps. Yeah. Good yeah. job, Hangzhou. That did not turn out as we thought it would. No, never mind. Three one. We changed it to three one afterwards. Ah, uh, fuck. <laughs> uh, Atlanta rain three two. Yeah, uh, okay, not great. And Houston I mean, outlaws three yeah. one. I think. Dallas. We I mean, had Dallas pick picking Philly. Pick Philly, yeah. Seoul, Atlanta, sh sh shock Shanghai. Can we talk about how impossible it is to predict these brackets? Like, Bro. there's so many elements that just make it actually impossible. And this is the hardest step where you have to predict the four teams, who they're going to choose, and then get the map scores perfect. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's supposed to be hard. It's not supposed to be easy, to be fair. God, this is just so fucked up. Okay, so we it's still have the Dallas Soul thing. We had Atlanta in the lower bracket beating Florida Mayhem. Atlanta beating Mayhem, wow. All right. We had Shanghai have a spark up there as Shanghai well. beating spark, yeah. yeah. That wasn't right. Again, yeah. I don't think you can go into Toronto this and fusion. think we were wrong for oh, thinking that. Oh, no, we, we went yeah. for the fusion over fusion. Toronto. Oh, we sense. overrated the fusion. Oh, I think yeah, I overrated the hard. fusion going into I this mean, quite hard. I mean, they were hard. so disappointing. Like, we didn't yeah. really touch on fusion, but what, what, a, what a massive disappointment. That's actually true. Johnny is wearing the exact same outfit. No, I'm not. Johnny, Look, I have, Johnny a, I have has... a pocket here. I don't oh, have a pocket okay. on He's the original He's become one. a lot more sophisticated. I'm sorry. How dare I? I have two different... Uh, two, yeah, I actually got this at playoffs by our wardrobe designer. So this is... Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah, I haven't showered for three days. No, I'm kidding. Um... What, what else do we have here? Shanghai beating Outlaws in the elimination. Atlanta. Yeah, we just had like Shanghai. Man, we had Atlanta going. We, we were. Oh. I think we can all agree we were wrong. Yeah. Wow. Shock beating Atlanta though. We had, we shock. had shock making we were... it through. Yeah. Okay, so we predicted the end of the bracket kind of well. The, well, we no, you're so about to put. Points. We, we had, had so many lads on the top. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. But kind so. of. We had Fucking shock at least getting ruined our bracket. Straight up, Smurfheads ruined hey, our bracket. Shut the fuck up. You were a gladiator simp. Yeah, yeah, but hey, you know, fuck you. You know, you had them. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, um, no. none of us did right. I yeah, mean, we, we all wrong. fucked up in one way or another. Maybe Dallas fans are the only people that have the right to be mad at us. You know. Yeah. yeah. But you know, okay, never mind. I go. I take it back. When we made this bracket, we were under the assumption that it was going to be Winston Tracer, and I think True. if it was Winston Tracer, I actually think Soul and Gladiators would have been drastically better than they were. Yeah. The Reaper yeah, I mean, kind of changed it. Well, so played... still played Rodo comps, but yeah, but, but they were better in being... the Tracer meta. They said that Rodo comps actually kind of worked against Tracer, and then Reaper just kind of countered it all. 
Which, yeah. by the way, is what is getting played in Korean contenders right now. Roadhog. Hog, Tracer, Sojourn, Kiriko, Lucio. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, honestly, I heard that there was Ana a... Roadhog, not Kiriko or Roadhog, but, you know. Oh, I saw I, I, There's a world in which a Roadhog works and is better against the Winston and the Reaper, but people are just... They're... They weren't willing to test it. Like, you don't want to go down on the Roadhog shell. No. no. Um, and if you do, we'll talk shit about you on Plat Chat. Um, yeah, yeah. And you'll look extra bad when you're like, we, we had an idea, I promise, guys. All right, <laughs> we've been on to, for so long now. I have a few yeah. quick topics. Can you guys stay on for a little bit longer? And we'll just run through. Yeah, okay. I'm chilling. Yeah. That's fine. Um, I'll say this now already. We have a banger of a vo Voidus Wash Worst Take of the Week for next week. Really? Uh, we have over we have over thirty five takes to break down. Um, oh my god! For this for this one? No, no, for next week. Uh, yeah, we we. Uh, are we I not doing it this week? Why are we doing it this week? Because we've been on for three hours, dude. That's going to take forever. 35 takes. We have 35 takes. I'm going to be fun. Because it's only going to become less relevant. I'm, long... I, can't do, I can't do plot chat next week or oh. the week after. To be fair, neither can I because I'm in Korea. Oh I'm in Australia. God. What the fuck are we doing? Plot chat's probably week? taking a hiatus. Aren't we taking How? a hiatus after this week? No, no. I'm going next Ooh. week. I'm just going to read ASMR bad takes to the chat and... <laughs> There you go. There you can save your thirty-five all right, takes. All right. there. Okay. What about this? You know, there's thirty-five bad takes, and I will. I let's take a look at you know five of them now or something. Okay. Okay. I have not done any prep for this whatsoever. This might end terribly. But people love this segment so much that uh, we'll we'll take a quick take a quick look at it. Okay. This is this is catering to the viewers and specifically Jaws and Costa at the highest level. Hell yeah, we got you viewers. Um. Oh god, this is a bit out of the ordinary. This is not usually how it's presented. Um, can I full screen a Google document? Jesus. Johnny solo plat chat next week. This uh, is Johnny saying... I mean, to be all fair, right. we're all away. There we go. Yeah. There's some good ones. You know, I haven't looked at these takes yet. There's already some good ones. So we got some play-in takes already. We got some play-in takes, all right? All right, um, here I we go. I didn't know the right okay. Here we go. All right. Boston loses to Florida 0-3. Should have played Mag. Worse Mag and MCD. <laughs> That's a bad take. The guy who had zero good game. Ga was that grabs? grabs. And so the wash flex support who cut even play fat. What? That is, off the is egregious. Even on broadcast, we had that win loss stat with Mag in and Punk in. Yes. And it's just astronomically better when Punk was in. This is catering to the worst take award in the highest way. There's no yes. shot you come out and be like, where's Mag? God. There is no shot. Comrade Hans is a Mag and stat. MCD. Yeah. What are you. Next up. That is a bad take. Boston beat Justice 3 0. I haven't okay. read these takes. These might, I, they might be not suited for work. Yeah. Pretty crazy that after a trade from Fuel, the K has been going downhill, whereas the Fuel has been going uphill. I think the K took the Fuel curse with him. The K has almost always been good. It's just that Justice or Justice, he has always doomed to fail in this org. I mean, it's not... That's not the worst take in the world. Yeah, that was fun. Playoff patches this way. Overwatch can't be taken seriously as an eSport. Would you have wanted to watch another stage of the exact same Sora comp? Let me out. It's not a playoff patch because Overwatch 2 only just recently released. I don't hate that one as well. No, that one's okay. It it's, yeah, it's okay. I have a, I have a what? Filter. We're doing live what do filtering. Be, no, but yeah, like, we're doing live filtering. Okay, that's reason. Right, elaboration, right. maybe. It's, it's more about that... playoff patches is why Overwatch can't be taken as seriously as an eSport. Yeah. Yeah. That's obviously extreme take, but you know. I don't yeah, think I don't fuck? think how you watch these playoffs, like especially the Sojourn players, and you go like, we can't take these Sojourn players seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is not gaming. This is not my eSport. All 400,000 people who tuned in were like... Playoff patch. Sorry, guys. Can't yeah. take it seriously. Yeah. I do think I there's... need some elaboration. There's no fucking way you actually sit and think that the eSport, the game can't be taken seriously as an eSport just because the patch. Like, yeah. you need specifics. There, like, there's, uh, I, I think it probably relates to the one dimensional meta, and we'll hit that quickly after this segment, all right? I just cool. want to do a few of these, all right? Next up. Is Changoon going to Mickey Mouse his way into two fouls on two teams? Three. Motherfucker did it three times. Almost got there. <laughs> he almost got there. <laughs> Motherfucker and... did it three times. Yeah. Dude, hey, Chang maybe Changoon's a genius. I, I, said this, I said this at the start of the season. You fuckers did it. You were like, oh, no. Yeah, you're... well, wait, honestly, I'm just, I'm just memeing. I, I, there's no way that he Changoon gets, is a genius. He gets the results. He gets the results. All right. Oh, my God. Uh, please tell me how DPS is the most skilled role here in the game. What other role can Flex and put on a performance like Tyr on the Kiriko today? Uh, 
So they're essentially saying that damage players are inherently more skilled because they can flex over to flex support. Uh, right. Roles, which I see. Which I think is actually something Christopher said in that legendary Yusuke interview that we now quoted like 50 times, where he yeah. was like, you know, damage is the only role where like they can realistically sub around like this. So um, I don't know. So far, these takes, not that good. Not living up to the segment so far. We'll do a few more. We'll have to find an I mean, epic the first one. one's pretty bad, but yeah, go on. Yeah. Defiant 2-3 Spark. How the fuck did the team with the arguably number one two Winston and the arguably number one two Surgeon go so damn close to losing to Toronto with Hotbone Winston? If Spark had three other actual top tier players instead of some motherfucking named Pineapple nobody's ever heard of <laughs> and a Titans <laughs> oh, dropout, they, a Titans dropout referring to Tiro, they could be a legitimate title contender in this meta. What? And I uh, this is a confusing take. What? Okay, honestly, I think this is awesome. This is a great take because there's a motherfucker named Pineapple. <laughs> Obviously, he's a little off the group. Like, yeah. I, you know, and but I, I appreciate the level of confidence coming into this tweet. Just because you don't know who Pineapple or Alpha Yi is doesn't mean that, you know, They're bad. blame these dudes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Alpha is also, Alpha Yi went crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Went crazy this season. But they, that was a series in which they played Pineapple for like the entire series. But, yeah, yeah, it yeah. was. Alpha Yi came in as the finisher. Also, I mean, Spark, they played this style the entire way through, right? I gotta give credit yeah. to people like Super as well. Like, he does what he does well. It's their strategy, it's what they do, and Super does it like well. So, yeah. Super Rush isn't the hero, but he's not the, the problem. <laughs> yeah. Fusion mm -hmm. 03 Spitfire. So, this is playoff takes, all right? This yeah, is playoff yeah. takes, right? Yeah. Carpe, just go to Valorant already if you're going to throw these games. Oh Damn. my god. Damn. Jesus. Holy That's just shit. rude. Is this, a, is this a bad take or is this just like mean comments? It's just mean. You this know, is just mean comments. Carpe carried this franchise to success over the last five years and this is the thanks he gets. People just fucking yelling at him to get out. It's mean. It has to be like a Fusion fan that's just like angry disbelief. Like... You know the cat meme and the lady is like, you go to Valorant yeah. already! <laughs> yeah. And the cat's just hissing at them. Yeah. Mayhem <laughs> Soul. 03. Oh. Oh. No takes. Florida through. Nah, they saw the writing on the wall and tried to mix things up. I respect them for that. Probably more work than most other teams. Unfortunate that mixing it up meant that letting profit onto heroes with more carry potential. Imagine making profit switch to Hanzo. Uh, I don't really get this one. Oh, I, is that talking about the map three when they went to Junkertown and that map was like oh, fucking yeah. wild? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They played Sig. Did they, they get three would How Snow do you count? White. How do they throw three maps? No, this has to be Junkertown, right? It has know. to be. Just Junkertown? I don't know. Yeah, was that the only Junkertown we saw all tournament? We only saw it. No, we saw it a couple of times. Yeah. But it was it was very off the goop that map. It was, yeah. yeah. It was like a Sigma kind of. Bullshit, yeah. Actually, don't hate it either. I mean, it was you know, a pretty, pretty fun map. I don't know. Yeah. Both teams capped, right? It works problems. for that map, yeah. for sure. All right. Rain 1-3 Mayhem. All uh, right, here we go. They played twice, right? Was this the teams that played twice? Yeah, I think so. Atlanta played, yeah, I think they played twice. twice. Yeah. Yeah. That was fucking Rain funny. got eliminated by Mayhem. They yeah. played twice. Uh, I don't think a team has ever had a season this dog shit with this level of talent. Brads need to step down as head coach before midnight. He makes the old Vancouver coaches look like fucking overworked savants. Shitters like Kai and UV aren't conducive to winning. If only you had a better flex support on the bench. What? There's some Kai fun. and UV. What really, the like, fuck? You're one of the most successful and decorated players on this team. What, what do these guys eat for breakfast? Do these guys <laughs> need a hug? Like, what's going on here? These, these people are just like fucking... In the in the worst way possible, just like I ruthless. Love, I love Brad needs to set down his head coach before midnight. It has to be before midnight, otherwise I will not accept this. I, this is the first time reading shit like this that I genuinely feel bad for giving these guys a platform. Like I'm having yeah. existential crisis here. Like why am I highlighting this shit? This is awful. No, that's so this fucking. Is, this is not enough. This is just like an take. awful take. No, fuck this. I mean, uh, it's just hell. It's also a hella recency bias as well, right? Like. Yeah, fucking before summer showdown. What top three, six consecutive stages in a row? Yeah. Who does that yeah, they, shit? Yeah, they, uh, one of those successful Alana's franchises great, yeah. the past couple of years. And then you guys wonder Brad why we weren't listening to awesome. chat. Brad is fucking awesome. All right. Yeah, I I think he's done a fucking stellar job. It's been one of the most like you can't you can't argue with the talent on that roster. It's one of the best teams built it's a good like fucking for the past roster. couple of years. They might have yeah. bombed out of the playoffs. I don't give a shit. I am donor walling you. They 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 have a sick roster 
and brad is a huge reason why brad is a legend of the sport and he deserves a ton of props there we go i think i yeah as as you said it's just recency bias like yeah they blew out of the playoffs it was not a good meta for them absolutely but like people just forget that they've been good for like a really long time yeah. like they, they've been going top three every single tournament for a really long time like you need to put some respect on that yeah i think they're great at scouting i think they do good business as well pouching vigilante at the time they did in washington that's great business and like acting quickly and like recognizing good vigilantes like tons also, of props. you gotta take the good with the bad brad took this team to fucking second last year yeah. in the they got fucking yeah. second last year dude <laughs> Nuts. straight up recency bias yeah people have a hate boner for atlanta rain and you know regardless of whether you hate atlanta rain you have to fucking look at the facts this is a successful franchise and they're good at what they do all right and you have to recognize that um so yeah i, I i'm sorry i brought this I, I should have previewed this comment this comment is fucking bad uh let's see if we can find uh, imagine getting absolutely rolled in one of the very few few full games you play all year gg's gator get it Fuck, no, this is just hatred towards players, dude. Yeah, I, this is not what I sign up for. This is not. This isn't bad takes. This yeah. is, yeah. Garbage, I mean, boring, trash shit. team. Remember <laughs> that they dropped EQO, Hisu, Rascal, Sado, Astro Poco for these clowns. Clown team. Now that Carpe is gone, there's no reason to support this team anymore. Just gonna root for London now. From I only like old Philly, Dazzling Bear. <laughs> well, well, I mean, there you go. There's the flare. Yeah. Uh, Thanks out. Chair, flare checks out. I think this is uh, a void is washed worst take of the week. Yeah, I'm down. I, I think I don't know how like you can just you only like old Philly. Like, <sighs> I mean, the Philly old was Philly great. was a top three team of arguably all time. Like, yeah, they but, were like, stacked to the brim of talent. Yeah, at, at some point you need to move on, right? Like, they they picked up good talent. I think they have good prospects coming in. Obviously, the season didn't string together for them, but they have some really good pieces for this year. I yeah. think if they get a they they throw up their tank roll. Um, I think they w look at their like uh, supports a little bit. Their DPS is stacked, but I think if you can get these other pieces, get some better pieces there, like I think they'll be a good team. All right, I'm gonna filter out these takes for next episode. I apologize to was some that shouldn't have been highlighted here. I genuinely feel bad about that. Uh, apparently, uh, Dustling Bear is also a troll. Um, I mean, if you watch competitive, read competitive or watch SRS all over the place as well. So, you know, I want to make sure we get the genuine takes here. There's been some all over the place. So this is what you get when you ask for a haphazard worst take of the week. You get some genuinely awful takes. They're not funny either. Um, did Dazzling Bear, was Dazzling Bear on some of these other two? Maybe he we was. Should, yeah. maybe, maybe we should ban some Dazzling more. Bear. From, maybe Dazzling uh, Bear is banned from the know. list. They're banned from the list. Yeah, there you go. Uh, all right. Haphazard worst take of the week. And we got some generally worst takes. Well, the segment lived up to his name. That's what we get. Um, thank God. Thank God. All right. Yeah, they're not, Quick thoughts it, uh, on some take. real. I I I, I want to end this stream. Okay, you guys did this to yourselves. All right. Here's some some last minute kind of topics here. I want to just go through this uh, quickly. Uh, first of all, we have to address this. Does viewership spike call for a week of hopium muffing? Can we just take this week to just like fucking embrace the viewership and be like, holy fuck, we did it. Yeah. Four hundred thousand peak viewership for the finals. Yeah, that's Woo! fucking sick. That's insane. Yeah, like if you're just a fan of competitive Overwatch and you've stuck around and you watch Plat Chat and you've been watching the Overwatch League, follow this league, just fucking take a bow. Like we made it. There, you, there is no reason to be upset. Just I was enjoy there. it. Integration into the client too. So we had like a little link in the client, link to the game, or a QR code to link to the game, like that shit. Just kind of busting. Yeah, we got a we got a game that's alive. We got we got yeah. people ways for people to come and see the YouTube and get yes. directed that way. Drops on that, that point. Stuff. There were a ton of like new viewers and also returning viewers that I saw like on Twitter and like yeah. on through various like comments and shit like that. It's like oh, I've just like I used to watch obviously back in the day. I've come back to watch the playoffs this year and they're really excited about it and a ton of new viewers too which is it's sick it's a really good sign and uh yeah who knew going free to play and actually having a game people can play as soon as they've watched a tournament is a good thing so yeah really happy for us so i will say you know um to, to set the expectations straight we were kind of blessed that the game dropped like literally as the playoffs started as well uh you know there were huge drops involved um where I stand on the take of like some people are just like, oh, well, you know, it's just because of the drops, you know, people farming drops, whatever. I don't give a flying Every fuck. Esport I don't that. give a fuck. I don't give a fuck why the viewers watch the stream. The fact they tuned in, 
I'd consider me like elated. I'm just like on yeah. cloud nine right now. Uh, every yeah. esport has no in Tennessee plot, nine. like every major one plus advertisers and whatnot don't really care that much about where the viewers are from or like like why they are joining into the stream so it's a good thing i don't i know a lot of we're so used to getting shit on and like being the punching bag in esports and like it's like british humor where you just kind of beat down yourself i think at that point a lot of people that have been around for a long time like you end up do beating down overwatch because you love it so much kind of thing and it's you know you see it all the time anyway so yeah i think at least this event we can be like yeah that was sick yeah. that was cool i'm excited for the i'm excited for the future you know yeah so uh so yeah it's a good time i want people to really enjoy it enjoy this time you know there, i think yeah. there are great things coming for us as well um that being said you know like setting expectations right for next year the fact of the matter is playoffs always gets more viewership so um you know there's big talks about or I won't even say talks because I'm not in those talks, but you know, I think everyone is asking themselves what's like what's going on between Twitch and YouTube next year. Like no one knows what's really what's going on, where we're gonna live, like what's going on. I'm saying as like we as a community, obviously I have no idea yeah. like what you know behind the scenes. I'm not involved in that at all. But I think everyone's wondering, like, will we ever return to Twitch? I don't know the answer. I don't know, you know, what's going on to happen. But for the regular season, um, you know, if we could average 100k for regular season next year, you know, like matches that mean less, I, I'd be pretty happy with that. So I don't know, like, if that's high expectations or low expectations, considering we were this year, but 400k, th there's not a cell in my body that believes we're going to average, you know, like multi hundreds of thousands of viewers for our regular season matches that are less important next year. Um, you know, I don't know what if they're, we're going to have continuous drops from forever from now on because this was a success story. I don't know what it is, but if we can average like 100k next year, um, I'm happy. Um, things are looking up for us and let's just enjoy it, all right? Let's just enjoy it. Let's not make excuses for ourselves to be unhappy or like stuff like that. Let's just have a good time, all right? Because I know a lot of people, they've enjoyed the scene for a long time. It's finally looking up on us. Uh, enjoy the spot in the sunlight and it's, it's going to be great, all right? People love this shit, so yay us. There you go. Woo! Opium huffing, all right? Um, all right, quick fire again. Did the one-sided meta hurt the playoffs week? I, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate, so you guys tell you and I'll fill up. Uh, a little. I think there's, uh, it's nicer when there's a, a, a little bit of diversity. I think any meta in which Reaper is in is incredibly lame in a lot of ways because it's sort of... Um, it just sort of like really hurts the way that the game is played of like, he just sort of isn't very interesting to watch and he just sort of shuts down everyone else from having fun. I, I would say when you have just one composition being played across the board, the issue is, is that you can't get excited about that Overclock 3K, that Death Blossom 4K, that big primal juggle when it feels like it's happening all the time. So I think it hurts the hype a little bit. It's obviously the game is played better when it is mass specific. You can change compositions. There are different sorts of ways to play the game. But at the end of the day, it's not the worst thing we've ever had. It's not the best, not the worst, somewhere in the middle. But I think it was, it was good in a way that we had a lot of new viewers and it was very easy to understand when you are not moving the goalpost very consistent, uh, very often by everyone playing the same composition. Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, I don't think Reaper is conducive to super exciting gameplay. He's definitely a hero that in the grand scheme of Overwatch is, is made to be more of like a beginner, like bait, more basic hero. Of course, there's still a lot of depth to Reaper um, in certain ways, but if the meta did move forward and it was Tracer instead of Reaper, I think it would have been even more sick. Um, I do agree with Scott in the way that it does help newer viewers. Like, oh, you know, this is the kind of meta that we're playing right now. And having a static meta just enables fans and maybe newer viewers and newer players that probably ended up tuning in kind of understand the game a bit more of a higher level and what ends up going down. Um, yeah, it would have been cool to have a little bit more variety. We got that Bastion from Atlanta Rain. Outlaws oh, played some well. wacky stuff very beginning. Bastion so didn't work cool. ever. Like, no, we, it didn't work. That, that's the problem. It didn't work, but that was fine. You know what? Even hey, if it doesn't work... rolling out with that in the arena, Chads. Yeah, yeah seeing, honestly, seeing it on the screen is... 
even if it didn't work, it to me, I don't fucking care because you still you still get to see like a little bit of uh, flair here and there, which is which is always nice. I think one of the best matches we have was near the start of the year, um, and the, yeah. after the Junker Queen, like we were in like super good spots for the meta because we were seeing a little bit of everything. And but yeah, I'm down straight down in the middle, a little bit pushed more towards the hyper side of things, just because Winston is cool to watch. Lucio is kind of cool to watch. Kiriko is very cool to watch. Sojourn's cool. Reaper, lame. But um, yeah, there you go. I, yeah. I think we hit a good middle ground, but it's actually still kind of hype seeing Sojourn's pop off. But yeah, the repetitiveness of having like, oh, here's the 2K, 3K with Railgun, shit like that. Like, yeah, it will get old eventually. But um, as long as we don't have this at the start next year, we're okay. Yeah, I think we got really lucky in that regard. We got a one-sided meta, and it could have easily been like some jotes that's boring to watch, and we're like, fuck. Reaper May yeah. or some yeah. shit like that. Yeah. And you we, would have died. We could have been really upset, but we were really lucky considering we got a one-sided meta that it was actually a fun meta to watch. And that's why I didn't mind it as much, because we got those Soldier yeah. in 3Ks. Like, we got Kiriko, which is like a cool fucking hero. Um, I, I don't know why this is, but Winston is like the, the, the exception to the rule where it's like Winston is a pretty basic hero and like well, I guess primal rages are pretty cool but I I, th yeah. I think Winston metas are really fun to watch and I don't really know why like I just find him an interesting hero to watch the way the game flows like the momentum back and forth creating space taking space primal raging so that's pretty awesome to watch Sojourns, of course as you mentioned Reaper like even if Reaper is a pretty boring hero especially when you just like boost up the attack speed with the Kasuna uh, rush the death blossoms are still fucking Awesome. Yeah, death like when you get three, so four cool. K death blossoms, yeah. still cool. You're like, whoa, you know, what, what was that about? So, in that regard, I think we got pretty lucky. Uh, my 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 devil's advocate that I kind of take is kind of what you said, Jaws, that like because we had such an influx of new viewers tuning into the playoffs and watching the broadcast, the fact that new viewers only had to learn about five heroes and this is how the game is played, so much easier to get into Overwatch, so much easier to get into the broadcast and the stream and learning what to look out for versus, hey, we're going to play every single hero in the roster, like Dota, Tia, or whatever, and um, and like you're just going to have to be like, oh, why is Tracer here? Why is Widowmaker here? Oh, no, now they're playing Sigma, they're playing Rodog, Orisa, like there are so many heroes and like following following the story following the heroes and everything that goes on it is infinitely harder for new viewers to grow accustomed to that now now i will you know as someone who was um very much against you know hero pool and all that kind of shit that overwatch is supposed to play with hero variety okay hero variety is like part of the charm of overwatch the fact that you can live swap to a different hero and you know counter comp stuff like that so Obviously, one-sided metas, it's not what we want, but it was sort of like, uh, what's it called? Like, it was sort of like a positive with the bad, that like, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, like, people did enjoy watching it, because we had fucking cool shit happen, and it was easy to learn, and like, um, people could watch it. So, it was very watchable, despite being one-sided. Um, I think, I think metas like this is like a huge, uh, huge argument for like, why high skill ceiling heroes, like Sojourn, for example... You know, we want more of that in the league. Heroes which has room for skill expression, like Sojourn, like Kiriko, is the fucking coolest to watch, seeing, like, top-tier players pop off on their heroes. Like, we don't want Moira to... You know, no no one, no one can... Come on now. Like, am I being silly here? Like, no one wants to watch... No, you're not being silly. I'm fucking hero, agreeing with you. Like, being played Moira's in the pro boring meta. as shit. It is I, infinitely you know more fun. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of uh, Grey from Paris Eternal way back when, and was like... Yeah, I'm so glad we're having like, oh, we're winning and shit like that. It's so much fun. And then it's like he drew he drew like a MS paint version of his gameplay, basically. And it was just Moira holding M1. Like yeah. that shit is not Cole is kind of cool, you know, just going through people and shit like that. But general Moira gameplay, are you gonna switch to her over like an Ana? Probably not. Yeah. Probably fucking not. So in, but... in many ways, like I hope. I don't think it's ever going to be like this because of the way, you know, the game works. But if I had a request, I'd be like, I'd love for it to see, like, if we could have heroes that when played at their absolute peak from like top 500 players like Ana, Kiriko, Sojourn, Hanzo, Widowmaker, like heroes that have like the most skill expression available in their toolkit, 
like yeah maybe they should be a little bit stronger when played well versus the counterparts that are easier to pick up like we don't need easy heroes to be like the best in the game that's when like the pro meta gets really boring and like that's when it gets a bit stale right not being able to see that skill expression live not being able to identify why these players are the best players in the world at overwatch right so um yeah when people say that like oh sojourns or like the developers say that like oh sojourns really really strong in like grandmaster and top 500 but sojourns kind of suffering in like the lower ranks like all right that th that doesn't necessarily have to be a problem for me yeah maybe we'll tone down sojourn a bit because sojourns too prevalent in the top games uh still but like th it doesn't need to be 50 50 it doesn't need to be that all heroes are balanced across all skill levels. Like, yeah. I'd appreciate if we saw more Ana because Ana is, you know, factually, like, a higher skill expression hero, right? So I hope, I hope this meta made the argument that, you know, skill, skill expression good for Watch Esports. It's fucking cool. It's fucking rad. I hope we get more yep. of that. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Sorry. I, I set us to be quick, and I took the most time on this topic. So there you go. Um, quick question. This can even be a yes or no. Was this the best playoffs yet? Yeah, easy, hundred percent. Not even close. I don't even close. think there's an argue, argument for that at all. No, nah, you you can't. It's just it went to seven, two great teams going back and forth. You couldn't have asked for a better playoffs. Yeah. yeah. Um, and some final thoughts, I suppose. What are your thoughts heading into the 2023 season? Just like your vibes, your feelings, excitement. You know, what are your vibes? How are you feeling right now, coming off this amazing playoffs? I think the league has been trending in the right direction over the last couple of years. Obviously, 2020 was a shit show, but 2021 was better. 2022 was better in its thing. If they keep iterating, keep improving, and keep making a more stable, fundamental, good game now that Overwatch 2 is out, and obviously there's some good things coming for uh, you know, the game as a whole, then hopefully the league can do better as well. So we'll see. Yeah, I'm saying I just... Hope the league just continues this way and more integration with the game is always nice. And dude, I don't fucking know. That's about it. That's about it's it. gonna be bog, it's gonna be sick. Can't wait. Boggers. Just... Yeah. Yeah. I just I... can't wait to see what the league looked like next year with uh maybe an even more refined format. Yeah. Yeah. Missless tweeted a nice thread where it was like about the playoffs and how this was the the Overwatch League playoffs that felt the most like us. That like this was the first time like we reiterated the Overwatch League from 2018, 2019, 2020, and we have arrived at this point, and it truly felt like we this was Overwatch esports. Like this is this we were not trying to be someone else. We are us. This is what we do best. And exactly, awesome. we don't need to be like that's a really good fucking point. Yeah, it's like we don't need to be anybody else. We can just be us. We're just chilling. Yeah, we're and vibing. We're, uh... We've fucking always been vibing. Yeah. We've yeah. been chilling. And we don't need been... to fucking bullshit with any other fucking esports or we anything don't need like to that. We we're not going to compete with worlds. You know, we yeah. don't yeah. need to shoot for the stars. We, can we don't be need to do that. Content being just we're ourselves just, and being exactly. What we just be confident in our fucking selves. We're all good. We do just cool enjoy shit. the product. Enjoy. If you enjoy it, great. If you don't, that's fine. You can do something else. You know what yep. I'm saying? Like, and Overwatch League is fucking fun. I'll say that too. Overwatch League is fun, yeah. and I can't wait it's to have more, more fun, fun next over the year. years. It's, gonna be it's gotten more fun, yeah. more so more lax, more relaxed, which is what you want, right? From a more fucking fun, more us, more relaxed, and uh, we have content yeah. next year. It's gonna be lit. All right, all right here yeah. we go. Last segment of the day in a three-hour, thirty-minute podcast. Friends, player of the week, and there's only one right answer. Go on. It's Butterfinger. Fuck oh, yes. Oh, the yeah, amount of fucking go. value they got out of that deal. They showing did. Butterfinger on that. I don't know how the fuck they implemented it. Butterfinger the chance in the fucking stadium. It, it was it went a while. It went a long way. Honestly, they, hard. they gotta appreciate what happened. Everyone bought a Butterfinger. It is a good time. It's we have sponsors again. Hopefully everyone sees Butterfinger success and is like, yo, we should totally sponsor the Overwatch League. Please come back. We like money. Yeah. yeah. They got like you said, they got a heck of a deal. We got hella numbers. Yeah, with hella numbers. I, I, yeah. I mean, I th the marketing team is finally after what's gone on the couple of years. You know, they're finally like looking at the, like the viewership reports, and they're like, "Let's get to work. <laughs> like, we'll see what happens." But yeah, I think the Butterfinger game implementation was pretty cool. Like, it was pretty cool. Obviously, it was unrefined. It was, cool. it was unrefined. Yeah. It didn't look great. But if you can reiterate on that, that's fucking like I don't know. I, Again, I'm not going to fucking go out on a limb here. But that's something cool that, like, we can do as a league that's unique sponsorship implementation. 
And yeah. um, it's also not that intrusive. It's not intrusive. Which is what and people that is... hate about ads yes. is that they are intrusive. Yes, absolutely, one hundred fucking percent. We we had this conversation the other day, but like when we had ads in between, like during the maps in twenty nineteen, between the rounds, awful, intrusive. Viewers fucking hated it, having ads run in the middle of maps yeah. between rounds. Who are we trying to be? That's an awful viewership experience. Having butter fingers on on the map, you know. Yeah, on King's Road for like fuck. ten seconds as the, the fly yeah, through, the, the doors out, aren't right? even open. Yeah. And fucking heroes, like that's a perfect implementation of that. Yeah, it's awesome. So, you know, I, I bet Butterfingers are happy. Thank you for sponsoring the Overwatch League. There you go. We'll, we'll see what happens next year. Maybe maybe Just I'll make a few go. calls. You know, maybe I'll make a few calls. We'll see what happens with Plat Chat. You know, we we need sponsors too. <laughs> <laughs> hey give, give us a call give us a call i'll have yeah, I'll yeah have let us know case all right there we go thank you so much joss and Costa for joining me this week what a fucking episode what a playoffs what a week uh I, i'm just so happy we did it Kels. i'm tired i'm tired i'm tired too yeah. yeah it's awesome all right uh when's our next episode johnny because as i said i'm not here for two weeks and jack's not here for two weeks i don't fucking know i'll phone up bren and see how he's feeling maybe he's still on the meds next week we he's make... also uh, in i'm with him in korea <laughs> i'll do an episode with siri next week all right we'll figure uh, out the way oh uh, yeah there, there are people who won't be in korea all right it's not going to be the fucking central point right, of the whatever universe. you say okay, so me connor and bren i am back me and connor are back on uh the 19th right? and avril's also there as well avril's also there we'll find a way all right we could just take a hiatus no i don't think anything right, what gonna are you happen. gonna talk about johnny what are you gonna talk about yeah. this we're having a fucking episode shut up okay okay, okay. Sure. okay. Episode this, next is week my, this is fucking my <laughs> sorry, podcast you know, you know oh, sorry, you... sorry whatever uh, you say Fucking take a break from content. Are you crazy in this world nah, we're living in, in this know, economy? Yeah, I mean, I get that. I get that. But what are you yeah. going to speak about? The fucking algorithm. We need to keep it up. We need to make sure the viewers are fed. You know, we can't just take a hiatus. They're going to leave. They're going to find another podcast. You know, we're not. We need to make sure that our podcast stays relevant in the in the, in the wilderness of podcast space and, and entertainment. Okay. okay? You, That's we, good. We, we'll find a way. You plat chat. Mm -hmm. I, I love you guys in the chat. Tune in next week. I don't know what the fuck we're doing, but. It's